what happens is people are so overactivated. They're in this alertness, hyper alert stress for so long. So the first thing for anyone trying to navigate stress, and then we'll talk about trauma, yep. is all trauma, anxiety, fears, they all map back to stress in some way. Now you can have stress without trauma, you can have anxiety without trauma, but you can't really have trauma without stress and anxiety. So even though there aren't really strict definitions of the boundaries between trauma and stress and fear, I think it's fair to say that trauma is a fear and or stress response that's happening at the wrong times, right? It's sort of carrying over from an experience that's making life uncomfortable or in some cases exceedingly challenging. For example? So um, someone has a you know sexual assault, mm -hmm. um, somebody sees a car accident or is in a car accident, um, veterans come back from overseas, there's kind of first person trauma where something happens to somebody and then there's kind of third person trauma where somebody sees something terrible happen. Mm -hmm. There's grief and so there are a lot of categories and so we don't wanna complicate the, the landscape and the answer but I think it's important for people to understand that the stress response is at the core of all of this. And when we talk about stress, I think it's also important that we divide that into two kinds of stress because okay. it defines the two approaches that people can take to combat stress, fear, anxiety. What are the two types of stress? Okay, the two types of stress are, we. the one is the one we're almost all familiar with because when we hear stress, we think pupils dilating, hands shaking, heart beating, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, or really upset, you're stuck in traffic, something is really bothering you, you're angry, you're having the, the fight or flight response that you know, that phrase gets thrown around a lot. And in that, those circumstances, it's very important that people take control of their mind and their body in a way that allows themselves to calm down, to reduce the so-called stress response. And we can talk about tools to do that, that are very concrete and that are very reliable. There's another side of the stress response. So what that, would that stress be called? What's that type of stress? Uh, so um, unfortunately, there's no <laughs> name for this. This is one of the important things. Maybe we'll figure it out today. Okay. Maybe your audience will figure it out. Yeah. They're, they're a smart bunch and they're living this stuff too. So um, unfortunately there isn't a word for this, but um, what this I, is one type of stress. This is one type of stress, which is you're, you're too activated, you're too alert, you're too agitated and you wanna be less alert, less mm. activated and less agitated. The alert stress. That's right, we could call it the alert stress, well, hyper alert stress. Hyper alert stress. Hyper, let's just do that for sake of conversation uh -huh. today. And we are by no means a nomenclature committee, <laughs> so we can always revise later. Yeah. There's another side of stress, which is when there are a lot of things happening in the world, pandemics, you can't work because they've shut, there's another shutdown, or um, there's strife in your life, or things are really challenging and you're feeling exhausted and you can't get mobilized and alert enough. Mm. And this has never really been cleanly laid out for people that and what I call the whole process is one of limbic friction. Okay, so the limbic system are these areas deep in the brain. Limbic literally means edge. They're near the edge of the brain. Mm. And when we're stressed, there's a lot of activity in these brain regions. And then we got this, our forebrain, our prefrontal cortex for the aficionados. And when we're in a thinking and calm and deliberate and rational manner, when we can control our body and our mind, it's called top-down processing. We're, we're controlling ourselves. But there's a lot of friction with that limbic pathway. I promise I'll get to the practices uh -huh. soon. So <clears throat> when there's this friction, we can call it limbic friction for sake of discussion, there, you can't control all those impulses and all that anxiety or fatigue for too long. And in fact, as you get more tired, or if someone has frontal damage, if they have brain damage to the frontal lobes, what you find is they become more impulsive. Mm. When they feel like sleeping, they just sleep, even if it's socially inappropriate. When they feel like yelling or screaming or swearing, they just, they just do that. And so mm. there's two kinds of limbic friction. One is when we're too activated and we want to calm down and we're trying to say, okay, calm down. Don't say, don't say the thing that you know you shouldn't say. <laughs> don't do the thing you, don't, you, know, you shouldn't do. And then there's the other kind of limbic friction, which is the world is happening really fast and we feel buried, we're overwhelmed, and we need to get more activated. 
We need more energy. We need more energy. We need to be able to lean into life and we're feeling overwhelmed. What's that called? Well, we, we should come up with a name now. <laughs> so that would be- um, Exhaustion like stress. Exhaustion or, stress yeah. or- um, Overwhelm stress. Or, or overwhelm stress. Yeah. Or um, Now, a lot of people start giving these names to things that sound almost like clinical syndromes, mm. which sometimes they are, but they'll say things like adrenal burnout which actually doesn't exist. <laughs> adrenal, adrenal fatigue. The, uh, now there is something called um, adrenal insufficiency syndrome, which is a real medical condition where people can't actually produce enough adrenaline. Mm -hmm. But most of us have enough adrenaline in our bodies to last 200 years, two lifetimes. So you, the adrenals don't really burn out. What happens is people are so overactivated. They're in this alertness, hyper alert stress for so long that eventually they kind of crash into the over fatigue stress. Okay. So one, one turns into the other one. Right. So the first thing for anyone trying to navigate stress, and then we'll talk about trauma, yep. is to understand in what kind of stress they're dealing with. Are you exhausted and having a hard time getting your energy up? Mm -hmm. Or is your energy too high and you're having a hard time getting your energy down? Mm. Because the solutions to those are often quite different. So on the previous um, time we met, uh, we talked about a, a tool for calming the body very quickly, which is this double inhale, long exhale. Typically the inhales are done through the nose, the exhale through the mouth. So the physiological sigh, which was discovered by scientists in the 30s, and then Jack Feldman's group at UCLA has really identified the underlying brain circuits. And then my lab is now looking at this stuff in humans in a kind of more clinical setting. That double inhale, followed by an exhale, we know is the fastest real-time tool for taking one's state of alertness down. The hyper alert right. stress. Right, you're not yeah. gonna crash into sleep, but you're going from, hyper, you're not feeling good, you're too agitated, you wanna calm down. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that tool is it speaks to a principle which is it's very hard to control the mind with the mind. So when you're stressed, <laughs> just telling yourself, don't stress, don't stress, don't stress, calm down, calm down, rarely works. It also rarely works to tell someone else to calm down. To relax, hey, relax, yeah. Usually it has the opposite effect. <laughs> don't tell me to relax. And it, and it can be damaging for relationships. If you've uh, ever, you know, someone's really stressed and you tell them to relax, sometimes it actually can create more friction and they don't sure. feel supported. What should they do in that moment? They should look to the body. The nervous system includes the brain, but also all the connections to the body and yeah. back again. And so the, when you can't control your mind, you want to do something purely mechanical, like the physiological sigh. Because that, you know, once you take control of the body in that way, then the mind mm. starts to fall under the umbrella of this top-down <clears throat> control again. Top-down control is what children and puppies don't have. You know, if, if, if we had a, Yeah, I've got a 10-year-old bulldog, his name's Costello. He does, barely does anything now, because he's Costello. But, he, but when he was a puppy, everything was a stimulus. He would walk over, pick up a cord, and chew on it, then he'd drop it, and then he'd pivot to something else. And it's because they, have, they literally have no prefrontal cortex wired into this limbic system. They don't have this suppression so there's no friction. The limbic system just does whatever it wants. And actually in humans with frontotemporal dementia and in certain people who have frontotemporal brain damage, they become mm -hmm. very impulsive. Well, my dad went through, I don't know if I talked about this the last time, so. but my dad had a, uh, a traumatic car accident 15 years ago. It was 15 years ago, a couple months ago, where a car went on top of his car and went through the windshield and the bumper hit him in his head, pretty much split open his head. His girlfriend at the time was holding his head together, went to the hospital airlifted in a helicopter, was in a coma for three months. And it's been a 15 year journey where we had to teach him, reteach him how to write, how to talk, how to walk, like everything, where it was almost like he was my father in his body, but his mind was having to relearn like a child. And even today when I see him and visit him, he'll he'll swear just compulsively, he'll, he'll do things that maybe aren't appropriate because he probably doesn't have the I don't know, you can probably tell me better as a neuroscientist, but what happens when someone has brain damage, especially in the front uh, frontal cortex? What, what happens to the brain? Yeah, so these top, when I say top-down control, there's literally a set of wires, we call mm. them axons, from the prefrontal cortex that suppresses these impulsive behaviors in the limbic system. And when there's damage, it's essentially removing that break. Mm. And you know, in adults, uh, older adults especially, because their behaviors aren't quite as, um, you know, because they're older, they're, they aren't necessarily going to walk over and punch people or, or scream out <laughs> right. expletives and these right. kinds of things, um, fortunately. Although sometimes you it see happens. that. Sometimes you see that. 
um, sadly, but those circuits aren't functioning well. And in young children, if you ever go to a classroom, uh, I guess now kids are home a lot, but in a ki typical kindergarten classroom, what you'll notice is that some of the kids can sit very still and other kids are rocking back and forth yes. and moving around a ton and the teacher and is constantly trying to- people, yeah. I was one of those kids, yeah, like, me too. You know, exactly. Like, <laughs> trying to corral the children and children mature at different rates. Mm. And what's, what you're seeing there is the different maturation of their frontal cortex. When you see a child that's very deliberate and can really control their speech and their behavior, you're looking at a child that has a lot of top-down control. The frontal cortex is really mm. engaged. Now- Is that well, genetic? Is that- uh, It's probably a mixture. It's probably a mixture of environmental influences and mm -hmm. genetic, like most things. Yeah. And I'm not trying to just hedge here. Sure. I think, um, you know, like for instance, I have a, a niece who, um, is adopted and um, she's very deliberate and very calm. And so we, you know, we wonder, you know, what, what, you know, is this genetic? Is it nature nurture? You know, there's probably some genetic bias and then there's probably also um, a lot of environmental mm -hmm. influences. I mean, a lot of what we're taught in school and at home, because a lot of kids are homeschooled now, is about what not to do. Right. You know, sit still, don't, do don't say this, don't say that. You know, we get the please, say please and thank you, you know, you know, sit up straight, you know, do your dishes kind of stuff. But a lot of the, the don't language hmm. is designed to around these things of top-down control, yeah. which set up a lot of important social constraints. Right. And we've all felt this as adults too. Where in two ways, it becomes really extreme when we can't control that limbic system. One is when we're when we're very fatigued. When we're fatigued or we're sick, or we're in pain, physical pain, chances are when something bothers us, we're closer to that threshold of saying the thing that we wish we would We don't have patience. Say. Exactly. No patience. That's right. So how do we learn to have patience when we are hyper alert or overwhelm, exhausted, stress? Okay, so when we are in hyper alert, there's a mechanism associated with that that makes our internal world measure time differently. What happens under those conditions is you feel like the external world is moving very slowly. Mm. I think I might've mentioned this in the, our previous meeting, yeah. but when you're really stressed on the hyper alert side, it seems like the world is going very slowly. You're gonna, just knowing that, and knowing that it's likely that you're gonna feel impatient and if the world is moving much too slow. Sort of like if you're, if you're trying to get someplace on time and the person in front of you doesn't know you're where like, you're going. Oh, I was God. the guy not knowing where I was going this morning. <laughs> and so, and we can't see each other in cars. So you think, what is this person doing? Oh my goodness. And they're just looking for the right turn. Yeah. You know? So there's that. And then when we are fatigued, it seems like the world is going really fast, okay? And so for people who are exhausted, everything feels overwhelming. Now, of course, the rate that things are actually moving in the world is the same, but the perception is that it's just too much and we can't cope. So we talked about a tool to calm oneself. Mm -hmm. The reason I like the physiological side is we, we are all equipped with the pathway. If people wanna know if there's some medically oriented folks out there, or if you wanna teach this to other folks, there's a nerve called the phrenic nerve, P-H-R-E-N-I-C, that goes from the brain down to the diaphragm that controls that and then controls the lungs. Mm. And so when you decide, okay, I'm gonna use the side, the physiological side to calm myself, in a way you're engaging top-down control because you're, you're taking control of your internal landscape mm -hmm. rather than trying to take control of your thinking, which is very hard. You can't fix your mind with your mind sometimes. Trying to control the mind with the mind is like trying to grab fog. It's just gonna keep moving, right? If you've ever tried to grab or, or smoke, it just moves. It doesn't, you, it's, it's vapors, you're never gonna grab it. The key is to, is, to, um, is to take control of the system by taking control of a real physical entity, this phrenic nerve. Um, and the reason I describe this stuff is not to put a lot of unnecessary detail, but I think when people realize that this isn't something that you build up over time and then are able to do, that you literally have a wire set of wires that goes down to your diaphragm, this muscle in your ab ab abdomen that can move your lungs. And then as you blow off carbon dioxide, when you do that exhale, you, your brain starts to calm down and then your mind, the top down control of the cortex can start taking control of the limbic <clears throat> system again. It's like, you're, it's almost like you're, you're losing control of the automobile and you're trying to steer, but really there's another lever that if you just pull it, then the, state, the steering wheel will stabilize mm. for you. So that's the way to think about the physiological side. On the other side of things, when you're feeling overwhelmed and fatigued, there are two ways to approach that. First is the kind of foundation of fatigue, which is almost always poor sleep and scheduling of sleep. This is something that doesn't get discussed a lot. I don't think I've discussed this on any podcast previously. But 
you know, getting better at sleeping is a whole set of practices. But sleep is a slow tool. It's not a real-time tool. Because mm. if you're feeling exhausted and you have to get up and have your day, deal with children, deal with work, deal with life, we can talk about how to get better at sleeping. But in real time, what you want to do is you want to bring more alertness into the system. Focus. Focus and alertness. The way to do that is to take advantage of a very well-established medical fact, all medical students learn this, all MBs know this, which is that there's a direct relationship between how you breathe and your heart rate. Hmm. And so I'll give a little bit of the background and then I'll give the specific practice sure. just so that um, people understand where this is coming from. So when we inhale, when we inhale, it almost feels like everything's moving up, but actually what happens is our diaphragm moves down Okay, so when we inhale, our diaphragm moves down. When that happens, our heart literally gets a little bit bigger. The volume of the heart gets a little bit bigger, which means that whatever blood in there is moving per unit time a little bit slower. And there's a set of neurons in the heart called the sinoatrial node that sends a signal to the brain and says, hey, blood flow is slowing down. And the brain sends a signal back to the heart and says, okay, let's speed up and speeds up the heart rate. So the short concise way to put it is when you inhale more vigorously or longer, you're speeding up your heart rate. This is, uh, this actually, there's a name for it in the medical community, but the important thing to understand is as you inhale, you're sending a neural signal to your heart to speed up. And when you exhale, the diaphragm moves up. The heart gets a little bit smaller, literally, because there's less space there. Then there's a signal sent to the brain <clears throat> And the brain sends a signal back and says, slow down the heart rate. And so... So this is happening people, quickly. So if you inhale, it's speeding up. That's right. If you exhale, it's slowing it that's down. That's right. So if you want to become more alert, you actually can just simply make your inhales a little bit more vigorous or a little bit longer than your exhales. So if, let's say you get up Quicker in the morning. In, or longer inhale, sl uh, shorter exhale. That's right. To, not To speed up your heart rate and to be more alert. Not longer exhale double intake right so shorter, yeah the, so longer or more vigorous inhales will speed up your heart rate and make you more alert longer or more vigorous or more vigorous exhales will slow down your heart rate and make you less alert wow and there's this has a name which is as as you know it's a certain kind of arrhythmia but that makes it sound bad this is actually what's happening all the time this is the basis of heart rate variability when people talk about heart rate variability is good you know, that you don't want your heart rate to be one level all day, high or low. A lot of people don't realize that. They think, oh, I got a nice, slow heart rate. And you think, well, all day long. Well, you're asleep then. That's right. Well, well, slow heart rate is better than high heart, artificially high, you know, sorry, excessively high heart rate. But you don't want your heart rate to be like this. You want your heart rate to go through these fluctuations. Heart rate variability is good. Why? Because heart rate variability reflects the activation of what's typically called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the brain's ability to slow down and calm the nervous system. So mm. a, when your heart rate is going like this, it means that your heart rate is speeding up and then your brain is slowing it down. Your heart rate is speeding it up and your brain is slowing it down. And that's what's happening all day long as you're moving through things in a kind of calm alert way. But when you get that troubling text message or you see a post or a comment and you go, and all of a sudden your heart rate just goes doo -doo 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 -doo, and you feel like you immediately want to respond or you're going to say the thing that maybe you shouldn't say or you're going to do the thing that maybe you shouldn't do <laughs> or you just want to be thought more thoughtful and more targeted in your response. The key is to slow down the heart rate by making your exhales longer mm -hmm. or more vigorous. So it could simply be and then shorter inhales, longer exhales or do the physiological sigh. Or if you wake up in the morning and you're experiencing the other kind of stress, which is you look at your Slug phone in the news and like, the world is overwhelming me. My life is overwhelming. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't even know what sequence I'm going to do things in. You're just discombobulated. And a lot of people struggle with this. The key is to do a few breaths, even while you're getting out of bed and, and preparing your morning coffee or water or whatever it is, and just start breathing in a way that's inhale emphasized. Which sounds weird, but basically what you're doing is you're speeding up your heart rate. At some point, usually within only two or three of those breaths, you're gonna feel more alert, and wow. then you can just go back to breathing normally. So you don't and, have to do this for hours, you do this for no. a few moments or minutes. That's right, and, and while I'm a fan of breath work as its own thing, 
because breath work can teach you how to operate these levers in your brain and body, so to speak. Breath work is a dedicated practice that you do away from these stressful events. Whereas learning to control your heart rate and thereby your mind using your breathing. So it goes breathing, heart rate, mind in that sequence. So if your mind isn't where you want it to be, don't start with the mind. Start with your breathing then which will control your heart rate, which will then allow you to control your mind. So don't, don't think your way out of a, a moment of stress. Feel, breathe your way out of this moment That's of right. stress. That's right. And, and one of the things, and I'm, I'm certain there are gonna be people out there listening to this saying, wait a second, the, yog, the yogis and the yoga community has been talking about this for centuries. What are you doing? You know, this is just a re, recasting of what we already know. I agree, I agree. Within the science community, these things have been given crazy names like arrhythmias mm -hmm. and heart rate variability and um, the diaphragm and the phrenic nerve. And so the, the language of science has known all about this for many centuries also, but it's been shrouded by language. And the yoga community has known about this for a long time, but it's been shrouded by language. So by bringing this discussion forth, I'm by, I just want to be clear that I, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel or pretend that I invented the wheel by any stretch. I'm trying to say that we all have these circuits, these levers in our body that we can that we can pull and push. And people learn how to do this intuitively, but we're never really taught the underlying mechanisms. And I do believe that one, and yoga is not big on mechanisms. They're very good on naming and on, you know, yogis in different areas of the world, when they say something, they usually know what the other one is talking about. Mm -hmm. Scientists do as well. But mechanism, if people can just understand a little bit about why the heart slows down when you exhale more than you inhale, or why the heart speeds up when you inhale more than you exhale. I do believe that having that knowledge in the mind allows people in a moment of stress to say, oh, I understand what's happening to me and therefore I should go to this particular tool. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do understand that one doesn't need to understand how an engine works in order to drive a car, but you do need to know how the control panels work. <laughs> right, right, right. This is why we send people to driving school yeah. and why we don't let 10 year olds drive. Um, although I'm sure there's some out there. Yeah, yeah, um, on a farm somewhere, yeah. Well, actually there was this one news thing, I don't know if you've seen this, where a, a state trooper pulls, or a CHP or somebody pulls over a car that's kind of weaving through the lanes on, and they pull over, and I think the kid was six years oh old. Oh my gosh. He actually managed to get onto the freeway. How? And he was driving the left-hand lane, and his driving was pretty bad, but he was below the- That's crazy. Wheel. Well, that just tells you that the young mind is eager to steer things and press pedals and things of that sort. And explore. We are definitely not recommending that. <laughs> but this is very different than driving a car in the sense that all the panels and all the controls are there. Mm. We have, we're all, most people are taught how to drive a car. We, most people are not taught how to drive their nervous system. And so a lot of what I'm talking about here is just one language, one version mm -hmm. of the language of how to drive and control your nervous system. And you can't drive your nervous system with thoughts and controlling your mind alone. You have to connect the whole vehicle is what I'm hearing. You can't just steer thoughts. You need to also use the brakes or also right. use different levers, which is the entire car. That's right. It's, it's very hard to control the mind with the mind. It can be done. There are people that or get better at that. Right, maybe it's but, a practice over time. But, but using, I say, when in moments of stress, either excessively alert stress or excessively fatigued stress, look to the body because mm. there are mechanisms that have been built into the body for hundreds of <laughs> thousands, thousands of years yeah. designed to do this. Now, the reason I can say that is that the physiological side, the double inhale, exhale, is controlled by a specific set of neurons in the brainstem that Jack Feldman's lab discovered. When children or adults have been sobbing very hard or when they're out of air in a claustrophobic environment, <laughs> they naturally do that yeah. to reopen these little sacs in their uh -huh. lungs. Now, inhale emphasized breathing can be practiced in a way, sort of away from stress in a kind of offline approach that can be beneficial for raising what we call stress threshold. So there's a whole other way to look at stress, which is to say, how do I get calmer <clears throat> in the mind when my body is freaking out. There you go. And uh, I think people will recognize some of what I'm about to describe as kind of Wim Hof-like breathing. Mm -hmm. It has also traditionally been called Tumo breathing. Some people call it super oxygenation breathing, although then you, there are other people like 
Patrick McEwen and company that will say, well, you're actually blowing off more carbon dioxide than you are bringing in oxygen. And so the naming again now is a mess. Yoga so, Nidra, breathe, breathe. So Yoga and, Nidra yeah. is exhale emphasized. Okay. But um, Tumo breathing, Wim Hof breathing, and super, what sometimes is called super oxygenation breathing involves uh -huh. doing a lot of inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. It's hyperventilating. Uh -huh. It's deliberate hyperventilating. <laughs> yeah. and followed by exhales and breath holds. Mm -hmm. Followed by inhales and, and breath holds. Yeah. Now, the repetitive breathing more quickly and deeply, this kind of thing, or some variant of that all through the mouth or all through the nose brings up the heart rate and causes the adrenal glands which sit right above the kidneys to secrete adrenaline they make you more alert and we know this my lab has been looking at this with a number of different measures exploring the nervous system and the periphery like the heart rate and you see these big inflections in heart rate when people do this typically it makes people feel agitated at first they feel a little bit agitated and then when you exhale and hold your breath for 15 seconds or so, or longer in some cases, if somebody's skilled at this, what you're doing essentially is you're learning to be calm as your body is flooded with all this adrenaline and the heart rate is going. You're learning to calm your mind. That's right. So you're learning actually to separate the mind-body. Mm -hmm. Your body might be shaking, That's vibrating. Right. And you're learning to suppress that. And you're just... And that mm -hmm. is 100% top-down control. Mm -hmm. What you're doing in those moments is you're learning to take your forebrain and say, fight the temptation to move. Fight the temptation to breathe. Now, I don't want to suggest anyone do this to the point where it's unsafe. You should never do this anywhere near water, even in a puddle, because people have drowned, people have died doing high oxygenation, breath packing type and of things. Passing out passing and passing yeah. out. It's, it, is, it can be quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. So people need to take the appropriate precautions before they do it. If people have pulmonary issues, it can, there are, you know, it can be problematic. If people get trained in how to do it properly, mm -hmm. it can be relatively safe. Okay, and my lab has been doing experiments um, on a, now we have more than 100 people doing different types of breathing and exploring how it affects the mind and the body. This particular pattern of breathing, 25 or 30 times followed by an exhale and a hold, and then a big inhale and a hold, sometimes doing more in mm -hmm. inhaling and exhaling type repetitive breathing. That is really somebody training themselves how to self-induce stress. And we know from some good literature mm. and some emerging science that's still ongoing that it is possible to get comfortable in these agitated states so that your mind is okay, feels okay when the body is feeling like it wants to tremble or move, that you can learn to suppress that activity. The ice bath is another good example of mm -hmm. this. Some people go straight to the ice bath because cold water will almost always induce a low level of stress in people. You have to, you have to kind of fight it. Even if you learn to love it. You still have to every time jumping right. in there. Okay, I got to con right. control the mind essentially that's to calm. Right. Exactly. So the body is saying, this is really cold. <laughs> Get this out. is really cold. Get, Get out, out now. And you're pushing back on that and it's top-down control. Mm -hmm. It's pure top-down control. And you could do this any number of ways. There's actually a uh, something called the hour of pain which is, um, <laughs> before you jump to conclusions, the, um, the hour of pain was actually described to me by a, a friend of mine, a uh, former military special operations guy, who said that you, they place you, this wasn't through military, but this is a kind of a, a outside the military Extracurricular activities. Yeah, activity. extracurricular <laughs> activities. Of placing you into one position on, uh, on the floor, and you have to stay there for an hour, which can be excruciating. There's so much limbic friction where you want to move so badly because the stabilizing muscles of the body and the feedback in our muscular skeletal system says, move, move, move. I just want to move the tiniest bit. And so all that practice is, it's just a different version of the ice bath. Yes. It's you're learning top-down control. So, you know, we started off with a question about trauma. Yes. And we'll get there. <laughs> but I think it's very important just to kind of summarize that people understand to just ask themselves the question, if I, am I feeling too much agitation or am I feeling too much exhaustion? If it's too much agitation, emphasize exhales and do the physiological sigh. Yoga Nidra is also a wonderful practice that is kind of the mirror image of uh, super oxygenation breathing. It involves long exhale breathing, lying down on your back, completely relaxing your body mm -hmm. and learning to completely turn off thinking, which sounds hard, 
but you can learn how to do it very quickly if you do that practice for about 10 minutes a day. Yeah. It literally means yoga sleep. And probably the most commented thing we have on the previous interview is where are the links for this yoga nidra okay. stuff? So we're gonna get that So before time. I leave today, I'll send, <laughs> there are several, but um, people can go on YouTube. Um, some of the better ones out there, these are all cost free. Um, Kamini Desai has a really wonderful one that she, I also just happen to like her voice, so uh -huh. it works for me. Um, there's a guy named Liam Gillen who has one. If you like a male Irish voice, there's that. They're all you have to pick sure. a voice that works for you. Yeah. Um, so I'll make some suggestions, but if people don't like the particular voice that's walking them through the yoga, find nidra, a different one. Find yeah. a different voice. Yeah. 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 Um, that's cool. So that's a practice that you can do offline, meaning not in the moment of stress, that will allow you to learn how to relax more. Mm -hmm. Then on the fatigue side. If you're in motion in the morning or in the afternoon and you need to keep going, you need to keep studying, you need to drive to the airport to pick someone up and you're exhausted, the, please don't drive if you're really, really exhausted, but inhale emphasize breathing. Making your inhales just a little bit longer or more vigorous than your exhales will speed up your heart rate and will make you more alert. So deeper inhale, shorter exhale. Yeah, so it looks something like. Got to speed it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. for, and even two or three of those, and you'll notice your heart rate will pick up because there's a neural signal from the brain stem sent to the heart to speed up the amount of blood flow. And what about working out and sleep? Okay, how, yeah. You work out in the morning, afternoon, night. How does that affect the sleep when you work out and how you work out? Yeah, well, I want to be um, fair to the fact that people have different schedules and different constraints yes. and that work, you know, getting that hundred and... 50 to 180 minutes of zone two cardio per week is essential. People should be doing some resistance training regardless of, of goals or um, uh, in order to maintain muscle because it's so important to avoid injury and maintain metabolism, et cetera. So you need to get it in somehow, but you then have to ask yourself what's happening around that workout. So are you going into a brightly lit gym at 11 o'clock at night and blasting music and are you drinking three espresso or right. an energy drink before right. you go? You're going to be awake. You're going to have a hard time going to sleep. It's not just the workout. It's the context around the workout. Yes. My preference is always to work out as early in the day as possible. That's my preference. I don't always accomplish that. We, people should also know that if you work out at the same time for three or four days, your body builds in an anticipatory circuit. You will feel an energy increase a few minutes before that workout. Mm. So if you are working out at 10 p.m. at night and you're finding it hard to go to sleep, if you can shift that workout earlier in the day, you will soon become a morning person. Mm -hmm. You won't. It might not be this as natural as somebody who naturally wakes up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, but let's say you're a you want to get on an earlier schedule, you want to get that morning light, but also force yourself to work out in the morning. And then by the second or third day of doing that, you will start to feel more alert as you arrive to the workout yeah. because there are these anticipatory circuits. That's cool. Working out late at night, some people say cardio okay, but not weight. Some people say, I, I think it's highly individual. And I don't think there's ever been a really good study addressing that. Mm -hmm. Regularity is key. I think for me, the best times to work out are three hours after waking up, 11 hours after waking up, just based on body temperature rhythms, mm. or immediately, like get up and just put the shoes yeah. on and just go. And I don't tend to do that last thing very often these days. I tend to wake up and move through the morning a little bit like a lazy bear, yeah. the sunlight, and then you know, wait for my caffeine, caffeine. <laughs> but every time I do that early morning workout, I feel much better and more alert all day. And you and, fall asleep probably easily. And I fall asleep much more easily. And there, the other thing you can do to fall asleep is this might seem a little counterintuitive. I said that you need to lower your body temperature by one to three degrees. You can take a hot shower or do a sauna, which you would think, well, it heats you up. But when you actually heat the surface of the body, your brain cools off your core mm -hmm. body temperature. Unless you stay in that heat for a very long time. So you take a brief... Um, you know, I don't want to say how long people should shower. Hot shower get, get in the sauna or whatnot, and then or a hot shower, and then t and, you know maybe rinse off with some cool water for not cold but cool water, lukewarm water, for ten seconds, and dry off and get into bed. Your body temperature will drop. If you get into an ice bath or a cold shower, You'll stay awake. You are it's a, it's very jolting. So I don't recommend people do that late in the day unless they want to be awake for some reason at night. But the other thing is when, this is a little counterintuitive, but my colleague at Stanford, uh, Craig Heller, works on thermal regulation. If you are 
want to cool down and you put a cold towel or ice around your neck, you're cooling the surface of the body just like you would put a cold pack on a thermostat. What's going to happen? Your brain's going to start to heat you up. Mm. So I would avoid cold exposure right before sleep, wow. especially if it's very stimulating, like to the point cold enough that you get that adrenaline bump. So cold air is is key to drop the, the temperature down. Keeping the room cool. Cool. Yeah, but you don't not want like that really- Not like an ice really, box where you're shivering. Exactly, yeah. the acute cold exposure, as we call it, of an ice bath or something. Mm -hmm. Rather, uh, a, a sauna, or a lot of people don't have access to sauna, maybe a warm, a warm or hot shower before sleep. But people tend to be very specific about this too. Some people like to shower in the morning, some people in the evening. I. I like to shower whenever I have an opportunity to shower. Right. Uh, you know, generally I try and shower after I work out because if I don't, yeah. uh, everyone suffers. Right. But the, um, <laughs> but I think that the, if people don't have access to a sauna, that that hot shower or warm shower before sleep can be very beneficial mm -hmm. because the body will naturally start to dump heat and cool off as you get into bed. Gotcha. And then in terms of the actual architecture of sleep and dreams. Mm -hmm. With with dreams, you know, that dreams in the beginning of the night tend to be kind of mundane and seem kind of ordinary, and the dreams toward morning tend to be more intense. Right. This is the you wake up and you remember like what just happened. That's right. Not what happened in hours before. Right. And the the early part of the night, in very broad strokes, the early part of the night tends to be when we release growth hormone, when we tend to mm. um, repair motor circuits and and damaged tissues, and there's a real lack of emotional context to those dreams. Now, mm -hmm. the dreams toward morning tend to have much more emotional enrichment and be very intense. Um, often if people visual, see visual hallucinations, that's in the, the so-called REM sleep dreams. Why is that? It's interesting. The, uh, <laughs> great question. The, it, it, well, two things. You're also paralyzed during REM sleep. You're a, you can breathe, but you cannot move. And there's this interesting thing that happens in sleep where when we are in REM, rapid eye movement sleep, we have high degree of emotionality of dreams, but we are unable to release adrenaline. This is very much like trauma treatment, wow. where there's a desensitization. You're coupling an intense experience to an inability for your body to move or to have a reaction to that. Now, if you suddenly wake up, which I often do, you'll notice that the adrenaline kicks in. But this is kind of like therapy in your sleep or trauma release in your hmm. sleep. And if you deprive people selectively of this rapid eye movement sleep, a number of bad things happen. But one of the primary things that happens that's bad is that when you don't get enough REM sleep, you are more emotionally labile during the day. Little things bother you more. You You're feel more irritable. Yeah. Yeah, anytime I see a comment on, on Instagram to me or anyone else and someone seems kind of prickly, like, well, I always just think to myself, I'm not getting enough REM sleep. Wow. Yeah, or I tell myself <laughs> that it, yeah. because I want to have some empathy for them. Sure, that sure. They're, they're just not neurologically up to snuff, meaning they're not working as well as they could. Now, there are other reasons why people can be combative, mm -hmm. but I think lack of REM sleep is one of the main reasons that we feel irritable, easily set off. Um, there, there are a number of very powerful things that happen in REM sleep that we should all be seeking. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, you really do want to try and get back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then as the night goes on, you're spending more, a greater por proportion, excuse me, of your sleep in that rapid eye movement sleep. And those are when you have your very rich dreams. And when you wake up, oftentimes spending some time with a pad and paper, maybe while you're getting your afternoon, your outdoor sunlight um, is a great thing because you'll, remember components of your dreams. The meaning of dreams has had, uh, you know, has been debated for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, and I think you, I think Matt would agree, Matt Walker would agree that some dreams do have tremendous significance, others do not. Um, there seems to be a very powerful effect of having a dream that makes people want to tell someone else their dream. Mm. Well, like we have this need, I think we just have this need to want to put structure on something that seems very unstructured. It is a way, in a sense, when we're dreaming, we're, we're crazy. Like space and time <laughs> are completely fluid. Everything's, yeah. anything could happen. And when we have a dream that feels powerful to us, I think we, we understandably want to put some sort of interpretation meaning, on meaning it. Meaning behind it. Yeah, I've had uh, great insights through dreams. Um, I've also had a lot of dreams that got me nothing. Uh, 
I wake up in the middle of the night and I tend to write things down that come to really? mind. I achieve my greatest clarity for kind of psychological and relational things. When I wake up first, you know, immediately I'll, I'll have a solution in my head or I'll think I'm, you know, the other day this happened. I've, I've been, uh, as we were talking about before the, the recording, I, I've been working through a, a very complex set of, of personal interactions. And these are, these are not traumatic or anything like that, but I've been working with somebody to try and resolve a really hard problem that we have. And we are both committed to solving this problem. And I'll chip away at this and chip away at this. And they are much smarter than I am. Uh -huh. um, uh, so I'm struggling. And then I will go to sleep and I'll wake up at three in the morning and boom, the answer, at least to whatever it is that I'm trying to resolve is right there. And I think it's because in sleep, you're trying, oh. you're getting those repeats of the different circuits. They're practicing, you're rehearsing things you learned during the day. You're dumping the emotional load through this trauma release type mechanism of REM mm. sleep. And then answers just kind of geyser up to the yeah. top. But again, I'm, I'm speculating. What we do know at the neural level is that there's a replay of the neurons that were active during the day in sleep, but at much more rapid rates. Stuff, a lot of stuff we won't remember. What you're saying. Much of sleep is there. Much of the dreaming and sleep is designed to get you to forget things that are meaningless. What is happening to the brain as you're sleeping? Is it just connecting neurons? Is it flushing? Is it, you know, creating these images for you to remember? What's like the, what's the actual mechanics of it? Yeah. So several things are happening. One is this glymphatic washout. Yeah. There's this literally a, like a spin cycle on the brain of dumping all the, that's the why junk. You, and that's why that's you why want your, your feet up. elevated, okay. right? That's why you want your sleep. That's why you want your feet elevated. The glymphatic washout is one. The other is adenosine, this molecule that accumulates the longer that we are awake. That actually gets reduced during sleep so that mm -hmm. we can wake up feeling rested. Okay. In other words, if you've been up for a day and a half, you've got tons of adenosine in your system. Caffeine of any kind is an adenosine blocks adenosine function. I want to be careful because mm. it's not actually an antagonist. It's a competitive agonist for the aficionados. But you're basically reducing adenosine function with caffeine. When you sleep, you reduce adenosine, which is why I delay my caffeine 90 to 120 mm -hmm. minutes after waking up. Yeah. So you've got adenosine getting pushed back down. You've got the glymphatic system washout. You have reordering of neurons and creation of new connections so that what you couldn't do previously you can do the next day and the next right, day. Right. You're learning. The trigger for learning occurs during wakefulness through focused, alert, motivated states. The actual rewiring of neurons, meaning the changes in the connections, occurs during sleep, in particular, deep sleep. So a lot's happening in there. And during rapid eye movement sleep, the brain is incredibly metabolically active. Right. It's just that the body is paralyzed. And some people experience this invasion of that sleep paralysis into into the wakeful period. It's really scary. I've had this happen. You wake up and you're still it's totally paralyzed me, yes. and you jolt out. No. Terrifying. You can't move. Yeah. I feel like I'm screaming, but nothing's coming out. It's really terrifying. 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 That's called what? Sleep paralysis? Uh, what is yes, that? That, essentially. But that's an invasion of, of sleep paralysis into the waking yeah, period. It's like wake paralysis. Yeah. yeah. And I know you're not a pot smoker, but many pot uh -huh. smokers uh, experience that more often than non pot wow. smokers for reasons that probably relate to the serotonin system and the so-called atonia, the inability to move. Interesting. Sleep. So there's that. Uh, what else happens during sleep? Well, there's all sorts of interesting resetting of the digestive system, the microbiome. Are your muscles yeah. growing or? Muscle growth probably occurs throughout the 24 hour cycle, but a lot of repair of muscles yeah. and triggering of muscle growth probably occur during sleep. Sure. I, I, he's passed now. Um, he was 11 years old when I had to put him down, but I had this bulldog, Costello. He was a 90 pound English uh, oh. bulldog mastiff. And when he was a puppy, I would take a picture of him. And then the next day I'd take a picture of it when he was larger the next day. That's after crazy. Sleep. Well, they're just growing at such a tremendous rate, right? And that's growth hormone. And during puberty, sometimes kids will be kind of locked up during sleep. You'll go in and see a kid sleeping. They'll be in some weird position. They'll get growing pains because actually the bones you know, it's a lot to orchestrate the yes. growth of the bones and the connective tissue and the brain and all that. It's not always perfect. And so sometimes there's a few days where things are a little out of whack. I remember for months, my knees would hurt yep. when I was a teenager. Yeah. And kids, uh, my dad like, oh, used to come man. in and push my knees down because he was worried that something was going on. That's the growing, you're growing. You're growing. I mean, you're growing. The bones are like yeah. spreading, right? That's right. They're <laughs> psychological growing pains and they're physical right, growing right. pains. And in your case, there was a lot of growing. A lot of physical growing. You know, I'm yeah. not. I'm not short. I'm. I'm six one, but you're six four. Yeah, you're. Yeah. You're, you're. You're a tower. Maybe six five, maybe. So, but yeah. 
Um, wow. So the you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in sleep. And are you burning a lot of fat too during sleep? Yeah, a lot of metabolism is happening during sleep. There's a beautiful paper that just came out. Gosh, uh, I, I forget all the micro details, so I, I'm only going to say a little bit about it. But a lot of the, the removal of fat from the body from when we burn fat is actually done through the breath. We exhale, it get, there's a carbon dioxide component. Isn't so that interesting? On. It's a sweat in the breath, right? And then what, just? Uh, not so much, not, um, sweat. not so much fecal elimination, but more uh, that you're breathing out. Breathing burns more fat than? Well, no, no, sorry, elimination of fat from the body, if it's going to occur, because I have to be careful, because the nutrition crowd online, uh -huh. they, they have claws, pitchforks, and, and they, <laughs> they like come to- after you. And they're, and they're ready, fire, aim type yeah, yeah. Uh, trigger. You happy. said this. Yeah. Exactly, so I want to be very clear, I believe in calories in, calories out, yes. as a basic principle. There, you know, there are people out there arguing different, but basically if you ingest more calories than you burn, you're gonna gain, gain weight. weight. If you keep them more or less equal, you're gonna maintain. And if you burn more than you ingest, you're gonna lose weight. Yeah. Okay, whether or not you lose from muscle fat or other body compartments is a different story, but the utilization of fat as an energy source and the elimination of adipose tissue, of body fat, eventually boils down to something where, you, yes, indeed, you are exhaling the, the eventual molecules, okay, but That's crazy. It, it, among other, uh, there are some other routes as well. I how mean, much, there's a, how much fat are we exhaling a week? Well, it depends on whether or not you're in a caloric deficit or not. If we're in a deficit, are we then we're exhaling that fat? Essentially, well, but it's been broken down into a number of different metabolic right, right, components. Right. That's crazy. It's it? really wild to think about. Well, if you think, yeah, and you might think, well, why not just remove it through the digestive tract? But it's part of a whole lipolysis, meaning the, the utilization of fat for energy, mm. the lipolysis cycle and an energy cycle. You know, if, if those of you that um, uh, enjoyed or suffered through college or high school, you know, the Krebs cycle and ATP and ATP production and the mitochondria and cells and so forth, that was a whole business there. Yeah. But um, so in sleep, this paper shows that, you know, each stage of sleep is actually associated with a different mode of energy utilization and carbon dioxide offloading and so forth. Or in the last episode we talked about, ideally you're, you are nose breathing during sleep, you are not mouth breathing. So some people actually will tape, shut their mouth with a little bit of medical tape. Huge benefits to that for getting enhanced oxygenation of the brain and body. You do not want to have sleep apnea. Sleep mm -hmm. apnea is associated with sexual side effects in men and women. It's associated with um, cardiac arrest. It's associated with a number of bad things. A lot of people who are carrying a lot of extra weight who sleep on their back or even just who are carrying a lot of extra weight, unfortunately, they have a buildup of carbon dioxide in their system uh -huh. at night, especially if they're mouth breathing and they wake up not feeling rested um, in all individuals, regardless of, of um, you know, phenotype, as we say, um, their genotypes and their phenotypes, right. regardless of phenotype, the kind of droopiness and the bagging of the eyes that can occur from sleep apnea oh. and the effects on, so get become a nose breather. We talked about that in the last episode, how mm -hmm. to become a nose breather, but you want to nose breathe during sleep if you can. Yes, yes. And your partner will thank you too because you're not snoring as much. <laughs> um, Are you, no, do you nose breathe at sleep? I think I do, yeah. I think I do. Uh, I, I'm told I snore a little bit right. from time to time. Right. And you know, a lot of people, um, even people who aren't carrying a lot of fat, but people who are carrying a lot of muscle, who sleep on their back, oftentimes they are they are kind of suffocating during sleep. Every time I hear about a, a bodybuilder or a very large athlete dying, it's almost always a heart attack during sleep. They're and, on their back. And or their side, but they're, they're asphyxiating and the relate there's a beautiful relationship between breathing and heart rate. They're very oh. it, it simply when you inhale, your heart rate goes up, and when you exhale, your heart rate goes down. Wow. And this has to do with the movement of the diaphragm and the change of the shape of the heart and signals from the brain. I won't go into all that, but when you inhale, your heart rate speeds up, and when you exhale, it slows down. And that's respiratory sinus arrhythmia for the, for the aficionados. So, okay. you know, you want to create a, an environment around your sleep where it's dim lights in the evening, you've had your meal, maybe a cup of chamomile tea towards sleep, maybe you use supplements, right. maybe you don't, you wake up get sunlight in your eyes. This is the kind of landscape you want to create. Sure. Cool room. You want to avoid very stimulating stuff, conversations and activity, you know, right before sleep. Yeah. Now, some stimulating activities before sleep, we won't go into details, <laughs> have a 
rebound effect afterwards. Matthew Walker's actually talked about this, how certain types of activities cause a rebound in relax, you know, they're very- So sexual activities. Yes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be, <laughs> yes. be vague here. Yes. I'm just, uh, what does that do yeah. for sleep if you have uh, sexual activities before sleep? So sexual activity in, includes, a, it's, it's really remarkable uh, at the level of autonomic nervous system. So sexual activity involves an increase at first in the so-called parasympathetic arm of the autonomic nervous system, the relaxation system. Mm. But then it involves increases in the sympathetic arm of, uh -huh. the, of, the, of the autonomic nervous system. And orgasm in men and women is actually purely driven by the sympathetic nervous system, the stress system. Huh, it's okay. A, and then the post-coital period is when the parasympathetic nervous system kicks back on and there's a deep relaxation. So okay. is it good to have sexual activity before bed or, or not that good? I, according to the architecture of what I just described, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, it, it's good? Yes, it's good. Yes, it's good. Um, it, yes, it's good. It helps right, people right, right. sleep. And Matt, actually, when Matt Walker came on my podcast, we talked a little bit about some of the data on this. Now, even um, hmm. th then, you know, so there are all sorts of questions about this that are now co coming out. Now, the the... the interesting thing about studying sex in the laboratory is very hard to do, right? I mean, there are ethical reasons, there, right, there are complicated right. reasons, and good studies have to be done in laboratories or by self-report. And with self-report, people lie, right? right? right they make right. up stories in one direction or the other. Sure. They're doing more of what they would like to be, they're either reporting more of what they'd like to be reporting of or less of what they would like to be reporting less of. But doing those sorts of studies in the laboratory is very difficult. There are sleep laboratories, but it's not often that couples are coming in and staying in those sleep laboratories together, although that does happen from time to time. Mm -hmm. But yes, after sex, there's a rebound in the parasympathetic nervous system, which is a deeply re relaxing component of the nervous system. Right. And wow. the, the reasons for that aren't clear. I mean, one idea is that it's designed to put people in close proximity, not just run off and look for another mate immediately, and to smell each other and pair bond through some of the pheromonal systems. Mm. Yeah. Powerful. But, yeah. Yes, very powerful. <laughs> um, an interesting form of a pre-sleep, uh, you know, um, biology for sure. And one that, let's be fair, as we were talking about during the break, every species has two main goals, to protect its young and to make more of itself. And while not all sex is designed for reproduction or used for reproduction, I mean, the, the whole architecture of the reproductive axis, right. as we say, from brain down to genitals is designed for that arc of uh -huh. parasympathetic, sympathetic, and then paras parasympathetic. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, and the duration of that varies between individuals. Okay. Right, that was a joke. <laughs> yeah. You gotta go at least 10 minutes to get the full effects. I'm not setting the parameters <laughs> that people should or should not follow. That is not my domain. I'm curious, where does brain fog come from? And how can we make sure that we have great morning routines to support us so that we don't have brain fog at all in the morning or later in the afternoon? Great question. Well, there are a lot of sources of brain fog. The most obvious one would be a poor night's sleep. Okay. And mm -hmm. sleep, of course, being the most fundamental layer of mental and physical health. I mean, you don't sleep well for one night, you're probably okay. For two nights, you start to fall apart three, four nights, mm. you're, you're really a degraded version of yourself in every that's, aspect. That's Emotionality is off, ability to do most anything is off, hormones start suffering. So sleep is, is fundamental. But assuming that you slept well, there are a number of things. One is your breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. and we often get into discussions of breathing, but this is a slightly different one than we've had in the past. You know, a lot of people have sleep apnea. They are not getting enough oxygen during their sleep. Uh, or they are mouth breathing during sleep. Mm -hmm. These days, it's become um, popular in some circles to take a little bit of medical tape and um, tape the mouth shut yeah. and to learn to be a nasal breather. And there is excellent evidence now that being a nasal breather, most of the time, uh, as long as you're not speaking or eating or exercising hard enough that you would need to breathe through your mouth, uh, that it's beneficial to be a nasal breather mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you are nasal bre deliberately nasal breathing during the day, the tendency is that you will nasal breathe at night, which tends to lead to less sleep apnea, less mouth breathing during the middle of the night, and less brain fog. Mm. Why brain fog? Well, during sleep, a number of restorative processes occur, but if you're not getting enough oxygen into the system, the brain is literally becoming hypoxic, and a lot of the cleaning out mechanisms, the lymphatic system, et cetera, 
as they're called, don't get an opportunity to function as well as they ought to. So you wake up in the morning, you slept your normal six to eight hours, but you're feeling kind of groggy and out of it. Mm. And of course, there could be other reasons that you're experiencing brain fog. Maybe, you know, for people that drink alcohol the night before, maybe they had alcohol. For people that, mm. maybe they ate a meal that was too large before sleep, maybe right. any number of reasons, right? Gotcha. But um, getting adequate oxygenation of the brain during sleep is key. So learn to be a nasal breather. And for those of you out there that say, well, I have a deviated septum. A lot of people think they have deviated what? septums. The problem is they're not nasal breathing enough. The sinuses actually can learn to dilate if you nasal breathe. Huh. Uh, exercising while nasal breathing it will kind of depend on the sport. Like if you box, oftentimes there's the need to do a shh or you know, mm -hmm. kind of like exhale on impact type thing. So I, I don't think anyone should tamper with their normal breathing patterns as it relates to sport or singing or some you know, activity. But what I'm talking about is when you're just standing around, when you're walking down the street, any low level activity, you're working at your desk, yeah. you should be nasal breathing and breathing regularly. That will reduce brain fog in many really? cases. Absolutely. It's interesting, when I went to India to study meditation, I guess it was five years ago now, I learned that the monks breathe through, they keep their mouth shut all day long. You know, their mouth is shut, they breathe through the nose, unless they're eating or they're having a conversation, their mouths are shut. And, um, they seem to always just be very relaxed and you know sharp and with it they probably get great sleep and it's interesting as you were saying these symptoms uh, breathing through the mouth poor sleep I realized two days before this brain fog day I was in Vegas at the Canelo fight and I stayed up really late it was daylight savings but I stayed up way past the time I was on an early flight back I just didn't get a lot of sleep in, the, in 24 hours before then I had a good night's sleep the next night, but the next day, so two days after right. the poor sleep, and for the last month, I'd been breathing through my mouth because I had um, a, a surgery where I had three implants Ouch. where missing yeah. teeth are. So I had three titanium rods and a bone graft. So I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I had to keep it open to breathe because it was just painful. So maybe those combinations of poor sleep a couple nights before and, and breathing through the mouth is what caused it, which is, makes seems, sense to me. Seems very likely. And then in Vegas, you, you've you got the air conditioning, so you're breathing a lot of dry yeah, air in the middle of the night. The other thing is about the immune system. So the we hear about the gut microbiome. Yes. Uh, and, and indeed, we have a, a lot of microbiota that live in our gut. You can have healthy or unhealthy microbiota. It's it's essential part of our biology. It is you know supports the nervous system, the immune system, and all of that. But if you think about the gut, the gut is obviously, when we think about the gut, we think about the stomach. But of course, it runs all the way up to the mouth and nose, we have a, a microbiome, we have a nasal microbiome, a mouth microbiome, we have a urethral microbiome, and in women there's a vaginal microbiome. Huh. And the microbiome are these bacteria that maintain a healthy, ideally, a healthy condition of the mucosal lining. So without doing a whole lecture on the immune system, <laughs> your primary barrier to infections of all kinds, bacteria, viruses, and parasites, is your skin. If you have a cut in your skin, you're more susceptible, right? But these are your entry points. You actually have an ocular ears microbiome too. too. Just eyes. Ears too, but it's mainly um, it's mainly eyes, nose, and mouth are the primary sites of entry for infection. And the nose has a filter where the mouth is just like you're sucking it in. That's right. So the nose actually is better at scrubbing or filtering out bacteria, viruses, and we'll leave parasites aside for the moment, but then is the mouth. And so being a nasal breather actually is better in terms of combating different types of infections, all kinds of infections. And there's a wonderful book about this um, that was written by a couple of my colleagues at Stanford if people wanna do a deep dive. The book is called Jaws, A Hidden Epidemic. And the, the authors are Paul Ehrlich and Sandra Kahn, and it has a foreword by Jared Diamond and an intro by Robert Sapolsky. So some serious heavy hitters on this book. And it talks about how nasal breathing, deliberately nasal breathing during the day leads to better sleeping at night leads to better jaw structure. It actually mm. creates more space for the tongue on the roof of the mouth and, and the teeth. They have some beautiful and not so beautiful images of twins that were raised apart. One was a nasal breather and chewed a lot of hard food. So a lot of using of the jaw to chew your food, um, you know, really gnawing on food is actually good for the jaw. Mm. Whereas the twin in these twin studies w were, went off to cultures uh, or areas of the world where they were eating a lot of soft foods there's, there are examples, for instance, of kids that had allergies at, um, to a pet hamster. There's one example. And the change in this kid's face, he went from having a, a very attractive uh, face to a 
extended, um, you know, the no eyes way. tend to droop. Right, because the sinuses are all changing shape. Now, the beauty of, of this system is that when you switch to becoming a nasal breather, the entire structure of the face and jaws change and the eyes become less droopy. This book documents all this. <laughs> Wait, so and you can reverse it too? It's reversible. Come on. It is reversible. Wow. It involves a little bit of work. One of the things that you can do that's kind of fun and a little challenging is just on your jogs or on the treadmill or any kind of low level, level cardio besides swimming, just nasal breathe and only go as hard as you can still maintain nasal mm -hmm. breathing. It's very hard for the first few sessions, very hard. but by the second week or third week, you actually discover that you have a greater capacity to exercise. Uh, my friend Brian McKenzie, who's uh, done a lot of uh, work on this, he uh, works with elite performers in terms of um, singers, opera singers, but also athletes, and he's done a lot in terms of using nasal breathing during exercise. But the point is that if you deliberately nasal breathe, even when emailing or texting, you also avoid what's called email apnea or what we should call now text apnea. They've done studies where people are texting and they're holding their breath. So you're cutting off oxygen supply. So I think the important thing to bring us back to brain fog is that you want to get oxygen into the system and ideally you're bringing that oxygen into the system mainly through your nose and not through your mouth. It doesn't mean that breathing through your mouth is a terrible thing to do. It just means that most of the time you want to be breathing deeply and rather slowly through the nose, maybe anywhere from four or five breaths per minute. I'm, I, don't hold me too close to that number, but mm -hmm. you wanna be breathing slowly and deeply through your nose most of the time. So it's probably the 80-20 rule, right? Where you're speaking and eating 20% sure. of your day. Yeah, if you're sprinting, then... you're gonna huff and puff through your mouth. If yes. you're weightlifting, you're doing martial arts, you're doing anything that requires breathing through your mouth in order to perform better than mm -hmm. just obviously do that. Right. But um, The rest I, of your resting time, mm -hmm. try to breathe through your nose as much as possible. That's right. And while you sleep. That's right. And it also helps with ear infections and things uh -huh. of that sort because the whole system, when you hear ear, nose, and throat, you have ear, nose, and throat doctors, ENTs, it's because the, the whole system of drainage from the ears, nose, and throat, right, they run together like a bunch of little rivers that all drain to the same location. The microbiome of the nose stays healthier if you're a nasal breather. If you're, the mouth is a terrible filter for viruses, meaning things can get in and cause problems. Most of the time, an illness starts with a throat tickle, like something's mm, happening back yeah. there. Like a little cough or yep. something, right? Yeah, it's that little itch in the, you know, that's the, uh-oh. What is that tickle? Uh, it's ir irritation of the, muco of the mucosal lining and there are neurons that sit right below there that are now getting exposed because the mucosal lining is getting worn away or the chemistry of the mucosal lining is changing. What's the best way to reverse that when you start to feel the tickle in your throat? Ah, there we can look to our good, uh, <laughs> our good friend. Well, a couple of things. Uh, slow down whatever you're doing. Obviously, if you, can get some, if you can get a nice hot shower or bath or sauna and then get into bed and take, get 10 hours of sleep, that would be ideal. But if you're at the Canelo fight and you're, <laughs> you've got that, our friend um, Wim Hof mm -hmm. um, practices something called Tumo breathing, it's, it's sometimes called, and that goes by other names as well. And there's a beautiful study that was published in the Journal of Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So this is peer-reviewed work showing that if you take two groups of people, you inject them both with E. coli, a bacteria which makes you very, very sick, but one group does a simple meditation and another group does breathing of the sort that I'll describe in a moment, that Wim and Tumo type breathers, and other people have, have mm -hmm. talked about actually for centuries. Yogi breathers, yogi. Yeah, yeah it, what, you do, what it involves is hyper-oxygenating the system so that you release adrenaline from the adrenal glands, which, ride, which sit right about your kidneys. And adrenaline is the trigger for a number of different immune system uh, cell types to combat infection. And what they found was if people do a particular style of breathing prior to the injection of E. coli, they are able to greatly avoid fever. They reduce the amount of inflammatory cytokines, things like IL-6, interleukin-6, et cetera, and increase anti-inflammatory cytokines mm. like interleukin-10. It's a really wonderful study. The pattern of breathing is really simple. I do it anytime I'm starting to feel a little worn out really? or like I might be catching something or if I was on a plane and someone around me seemed like they weren't doing so well or I just am feeling a little worn out. And uh, forgive me because there's no other way to do it but just to do it, but it involves 25 deep breaths in through the nose, in this case, out through the mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a case where breathing through the mouth is appropriate. So in through the nose, out through the mouth. Then at the end of that, exhaling all your air, holding your breath for 15 to 60 seconds. Don't fight the impulse to breathe when you feel the impulse to mm -hmm. breathe. Breathe in and then hold your breath for 
as long as you can until you feel the impulse to breathe. Obviously, don't do this in your water. Believe it or not, a few people have actually died doing this because mm. they did it in a bathtub or before um, t- diving under, yeah. underwater. So please don't do that. But it basically, I won't do the all 25, but it's it goes something like this. So big, deep breaths, right? And I can already feel I'm kind of heating up. Yeah. That's the release of adrenaline. A little tingly feeling. You're hyperoxygenating. Yeah. You're releasing adrenaline. Adrenaline is the signal for the immune system to deploy these killer cells and these cells that go and combat infection. And we don't often think about the fact that stress actually is the go signal for the immune system. We always hear stress depletes your immune system. And that's true if you remain chronically stressed. But humans are phenomenally good at combating stressors. And then they stop, they relax, and boom, they get sick because the adrenaline signal drops. The other way you could do this would be to do an, an ice bath or really cold shower. Uh-huh. You get the adrenaline release. That's basically the effect of the ice bath or cold shower. It's the adrenaline release. Some people will do well by doing a short HIIT workout, you know, a hit high intensity mm-hmm. interval training workout, because again, it's adrenaline. So it not a depleting workout, but you know, 12 minutes of, of sprint walk, sprint walk. Mm-hmm. You know, my sprints are very different than your sprints because like you actually sprint. <laughs> You're faster than me still. <laughs> in not in my best, best dream, uh, but thank you for that. You can lift more, that's for sure. Not, not in my best, best dream, <laughs> but, uh, but thank you for that. Uh, so this is something that I occasionally do if I'm traveling mm-hmm. or I'm just feeling kind of worn down. I'll do it, I'll do maybe two or three rounds of what I just described. Mm-hmm. And it's, It all boils down to adrenaline release. Really? As you can tell by this episode, we can always count on Andrew for science-backed tips and advice on how to optimize ourselves. And after this conversation, I was so inspired myself to actively seek out a product that will help improve my day-to-day life. And today's sponsor is Endel, an award-winning app that harnesses the power of sound to improve your focus, sleep, and overall mental health. And let me give you a quick tour of this app. Endel takes into account the current amount of outdoor natural light in my location, the weather, my heart rate, my wake up time, and my activity level to create a soundscape in real time just for me. Now, Endel uses AI technology to understand your exact needs and enhance your state of mind through sound. Whether you need to get to sleep, concentrate on the task at hand, or unwind after a long day, Endel generates personalized soundscapes in real time that are customized to you. Endel also integrates with Apple Watch, Aura Ring, and Alexa, allowing you to deepen its personalization. I use it while doing some work to prep for an interview, and I was able to zone in and get into deep focused state. If you wanna try it for yourself, I've worked with the team at Endel to give you a whole month for free with full access to Endel's soundscapes, library, and features. If you want to try it for free right now, head to endel.io slash Lewis to grab your free month. Now let's get back to the interview. That bolus, as we call it, a shot of adrenaline to your system signals the immune system to turn on. and To defend to itself. To defend itself. Getting sick. That's right. And this is why... Uh, people who have ever taken care of a sick child or a sick relative, you can go, go, go. You don't eat, you don't sleep. There's no, we, you know, no self-care and you're not getting sick. Now, of course, if you're exposed to enough viral load or you're exposed to enough of a bacteria, you know, it might get you. But this mm-hmm. is the sort of thing I would do if I was feeling a little bit of a throat tickle, a little rundown. But then I would also do the, the shower, make sure you get some decent food and, yes. and get a good, good, good sleep. sleep. So what's the routine then, the ultimate morning and evening routine to set your brain and your mind up for optimal performance and not getting brain fog. Okay. Um, I will describe that uh, by listing out the protocol first, and then I'll give some of the scientific mechanism Perfect. second. Because yes. in the past, what I've tended to do is uh, <laughs> give the mechanism and then give the protocols. I know some people, it's like, you know, enough of these academic guys, they'll just give me the give me, tell them, just tell me what to do. But if people want the mechanism, I'd yes. be happy to flesh that out. Yes. I should say that what I will mention is not everything I do. Um, so mm-hmm. for instance, uh, I get up and like most humans, I use the restroom and I have a glass of water. Brush I do those teeth, things. So yeah. if, I, if I, I'm not listing every, every right foot, left foot step through the morning, but, yes. but the things that are geared towards getting the mind into a proper place, for me, I'll describe it as my routine. I, I generally get up somewhere between 
five thirty and seven in the morning, depending on when I went to sleep. Mm-hmm. I'm not super regular about when I go to sleep, um, but generally that's between ten thirty and uh, midnight. Yeah, you know, I try and avoid that midnight hour, but um, happens. So I get up. Obviously, I use the restroom. I drink some water. I do think that hydrating is very important. Yes. Uh, so I will. I'll drink some some water, and then the fundamental layer of health is to set your circadian rhythm. The simplest way to do that is to go outside for 10 minutes and get some bright light in your eyes. I'll just list off some of the things that people always ask. What if you wake up before the sun rises? Well, simple rule. If you want to be awake, turn on as many bright lights in your house as possible. But then when the sun goes out, it comes out, excuse me, get outside Mm -hmm. and see some sunlight. You do not have to look directly into the sun but you do want to get outside out of shade cover if you can. Don't wear sunglasses if you can do that safely. Don't try and do this through a window. Don't try and negotiate with me on this mm, point. People go like, outside. What about a window? Well, the filtration of the, of the important wavelengths of light through the window is just too high, and so it would take hours for you to set your circadian clock mm. that way. You want to do this because once every 24 hours, you're going to get a, a peak in cortisol, which is a healthy peak. You want that peak to happen early in the day because it sets up alertness for the remainder of the day. Mm. There are really nice studies done by my colleagues in Stanford Psychiatry and Biology Department showing that if that cortisol peak starts to drift too late in the day, you start seeing signs of depression. It's actually a well-known marker of depression. So you want that cortisol almost stressed out, kind of oh, the day's beginning, I have a lot to do feeling. That's a healthy thing. You want that happening early in the day. Mm. The sunlight will wake you up. And what's really cool is that over time, you'll start to notice the sunlight waking you up more and more. The system becomes tuned up. If you miss a day, it's not the end of the world because it's a, as we call it, a slow integrating system, but don't miss more than one day. And if you live in an area where it's very cloudy outside, just know that the sunlight, the photons coming through that cloud cover are brighter than your brightest indoor lights. Now, if you live in a very dark region of the world or it's unsafe or purely impractical to get outside in the morning, then it might make sense to get a a sunrise simulator or one of these lights, but they tend to be very expensive. What I recommend people use instead is just a ring light, a ring blue light. This is a case where you can blast your system. Wow. Um, So get that morning light. That this is, it sets a number of things in motion, such as your melatonin rhythm to happen 16 hours later to help you fall asleep. I would say this is the fundamental step of any good morning. And if you don't do this enough, you are messing yourself up in a number of ways. Does this mess with digestion also? Yeah, so every cell in your body has a 24 hour clock. All those clocks need to be aligned to the same time. So imagine a clock shop with lots of different clocks Mm. and you don't want them alarming off at different times. This sunlight viewing or bright light viewing early in the day, I would say within 30 to 60 minutes of waking up for about 10 minutes or if it's very cloudy, maybe 30 minutes or so, that activates a particular type of neuron in the eye called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell, if people wanna look that up, signals to the circadian clock, which is right above the roof of your mouth, but that is the master circadian clock that then releases a bunch of signals into your body. This all happens very fast, Mm. and every cell in your body gets tuned to the exact same time reference point so that your system can work as a nice concert of cells as opposed to out of whack. Your gut has a clock, your liver has a clock, your heart cells have a clock, Every skin cell has a clock. And for those that are not incentivized enough by the cortisol stuff and all the other things, actually the replenishment of stem cells in the skin, hair, and nails is activated by the system. So hair grows more readily, um, skin turns over, and nails grow more quickly Mm. because you have stem cells, literally cells that release more cells that become new hair cells or new skin cells and new... Uh, cells that make up the nails. So skin, hair, and nails also benefit, and it has to be light exposure to the eyes. When we talk about all these things like the gut and the skin, et cetera, it's tempting to say, oh, it's sunlight on the skin. No, it's actually only can be signaled through the eyes because the clock lives deep in the brain, that master clock, and you need the signal to get to that master clock. So don't wear sunglasses. If If you can avoid wearing sunglasses safely, Right? There are people, for instance, who have macular degeneration it's, who have to avoid bright lights and, and they know mm-hmm. this because their ophthalmologist right. tells them. Uh, if you wear corrective lenses, contacts, even if it has UV filtration, that's fine. In fact, if you mm. think about what, a, what an eyeglass or a contact lens does is it focuses light onto the eye. 
actually on the retina positive, on the yeah. back of the eye. Whereas looking through a window filters it. It, it, it blocks a certain mm -hmm. amount of light coming in, even if it's a very clear window. So go outside, if you wear glasses, fine. If you wear contacts, fine. And if you can get out on a porch and be you know, east facing in the morning when the sun comes up, great. You don't need to see the sun cross the horizon, but ideally you see the sun when it's at what we call low solar angle. It's not directly overhead. If you wait two or three oh. hours to, after waking up um, to get bright light in your eyes, you are setting yourself up for a complicated sleep-wake cycle that leads to a lot of what we call insomnia. Mm. Mm. So this is important to do in the first 60 minutes of waking up. Yep. Get outside, 10 minutes. You don't have to be in the sun, but you want to be able to look and see the sun, right? Or yes. is it okay to be in the shade or you want the sunlight hitting your skin also? It depends on how bright it is. So for instance, this morning I woke up because of where I live, there's a lot of tree cover, but I saw that the sun was, was uh, there were a lot of shadows, but it was casting a nice patch of light uh, in the street right in front of my house. Uh -huh. So I'm the weirdo that walked out there <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> with my coffee. Uh, actually, I delay my coffee. It was with my water in the morning. I'll talk about why I delay coffee. And I, um, and I, you know, I'm leaning against a tree. I confess I was <laughs> text messaging it part for part of that, yeah. you know, forgive me, I'm human. And catching the sunlight coming in through my eyes for a few minutes, I, I allow myself to blink. Obviously, I'm not. So you'll look, you won't look directly at the sun. You don't want to look directly. You'll there's a safety. I guess if it's a lower. Yeah. lower horizon. It's not that intense. Yeah. We have a built-in safety mechanism, which is if you need to blink and close your eyes, close your eyes. Yeah. But yeah, I got sunlight in my eyes. I get the weird looks from my neighbors, but they know me um, and they do it too. Sometimes they'll join me. Yeah. Animals will naturally do this. They'll migrate to the sun. So cool. then I go, I go inside. It's 10 minutes um, or so. It seems like a long time, but it is so beneficial. Mm. And then inside, if I want to be awake, I try and turn on as many bright lights as I can. One of the big mistakes that we've made in the last few years as a, as a culture is assuming that blue light is bad. During the day, lots of blue light is great because it, the, that's the, the best signal for these cells that wake up your, your system. It activates all sorts of important hormone pathways and mm -hmm. wakefulness pathways. Interesting. Re it can reduce brain fog in, in some sense. Sure. It's in the evening that you want to avoid blue lights and bright lights of any kind. We can talk about that. But okay. So then I come back inside and then I do not drink caffeine right away. It's important in many ways to delay caffeine enough so that you can clear out some of the chemical signals in the brain and body that lead to a, that lead to a feeling of fatigue. So the longer you're mm. awake, the more a molecule called adenosine builds up in your system. And when you sleep, you push that adenosine level back down. When you wake up in the morning, that adenosine level can be zero, but oftentimes there's still some hanging around. Caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. It blocks adenosine function. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's effectively what it does. So if you wake up and you've got, let's say 20%, let's make, uh, this is arbitrary, but 20% of your adenosine has still hasn't been cleared out. That's sort of a drowsiness that you woke up with. Mm -hmm. Then you go and you drink your coffee and you crush that, that uh, ability of adenosine to have that effect, but it hasn't gone away. So that when your coffee wears off mid-morning, now that adenosine is there and you feel like there's a mid-morning crash or an afternoon crash. So I delay my caffeine intake for about 90 and ideally 120 mm. minutes after I wake up. Because in that way, you bring your adenosine level down very, very low to zero. And then you don't get this rebound crash in the afternoon. For years, I would get this post-lunch crash. And I thought maybe I'm eating too much for lunch, which right. I probably was, or maybe I'm eating the wrong <laughs> foods. Turned out it was all related to my timing of caffeine. Gosh. So, and your system learns how to wake up naturally. Right. You get the natural cortisol and adrenaline. Release. Give it the time. Yeah. Give it the time. And people hate this one because it's, it's a little painful for the caffeine addicts, but I'm a pretty serious caffeine addict and I embrace that. And I'll tell you, it also makes the joy of the coffee so much greater. You're like waiting for yeah. that, you're savoring it, exactly. like, oh, my it, first oh, it tastes so much better. Um, <laughs> and that relates to the dopamine system, which I know we're going to talk Ooh, about yes. later. I sometimes will drink yerba mate instead of... Yeah, I love um, mate. Mate has a, a Do couple... Do you put honey in it or anything? Like I don't. Sweet stevia or something? I don't really like sweet stuff too much. Man, I um, wish I had that disease. Yeah, it's... You know, I wish I had I like that. savory things and yeah. salty things. Um, I... I like yerba mate for a number of reasons. I don't like the really smoky mates. And, and my mm -hmm. dad's Argentine, so I grew up drinking mate. But You don't speak Spanish, though, do you? Uh, I speak four words of Spanish, and, <laughs> and, and those I speak uh, poorly. So yeah. Is your dad's he, fluent? He's fluent. Come I, on. I know. Parents who are... How right, do you... That's a crime, isn't know, it? It's a crime. Well, it's not a crime I committed. I love well, my dad. dad but, committed, yeah. Well, p bilingual parents, please encourage your children to learn multiple languages. What? Musicians... 
parents. Teach you know. your kids the, the instrument. Yeah, have what you ever the, seen who, the people who play guitar in college? Let's just say their lives are, are better than <laughs> everyone else's. How much does the body control the mind and the mind control the body? Are they very connected or is the mind in complete control? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. The short answer is the body has a huge and profound influence on our mind. And the reason is that we often talk about the brain and we think the brain, the brain, the brain. The brain is important, but the brain and the spinal cord, which is, makes up what we call the central nervous system, are extensively connected with the body and the body is extensively connected with the brain and spinal cord. So the spinal cord is connected to the brain. That's right. In the back, it comes up the neck. That's right. And it's, the actual nerves are connected inside of your brain. That's you right. Go all the way down to lower back. Or? Yeah. Yeah, so basically we are a big tube uh, or our nervous system is a big tube. So your brain obviously is the thing that's shaped like more or less like this. And then the spinal cord extends off the back and all that is housed in skull, except for two pieces of the brain, uh, which are the eyes, which are the, actually two pieces of the brain that are outside the skull. The eyes are a part of the brain. They are absolutely a part of the brain. They are central nervous system. So it's eyes, brain, and spinal cord. Make they're all up, connected. They're all connected. So if, and if you took that out of the body, let's yeah. say, they would all be connected. That's in some right. Way. They're contiguous, as we say. They're just one they're, unit. They're one piece. That's right. And when uh, sometimes they get challenged, people say the eyes aren't part of the brain. And, well, then that means that the spinal cord is part of the brain too. And I, I want to be really clear, this is not semantics. There is a genetic program that ensures that early in development, during the first trimester, when we were all in our mother's bellies, the retinas, the neural retinas and eyes were deliberately pushed out of the skull. And the reason you have those eyes outside your skull is so that you can evaluate things at a great distance from you, right? Because otherwise everything would have to be in contact with you. Other animals do this mainly using smell. We are very visually driven. So a lot of our genome is devoted to vision and understanding what's going on at a distance from us. And that's afforded us a huge evolutionary advantage. To survive. To survive, because the, the more that I can anticipate events at a distance, the more that I could coordinate with my environment, like daytime and nighttime, but also when objects are coming at me or things I wanna chase and kill, or um, you, know, you think about mating behavior and hunter-gatherer behavior, all of that, evaluating faces and face, facial expressions without actually having to come into contact with people, <clears throat> afford a huge evolutionary advantage. But I wanna make sure that I answer your question mm -hmm. thoroughly. The nervous system includes the brain, which we now know includes the eyes as well, the spinal cord, and then what's called the peripheral nervous system, all the connections with the body and every organ in our body, our heart, our diaphragm, our lungs, our spleen, our liver, all of it is, is it, as we say, innervated. It receives Connected nerve connections. To the brain? That's right, from the brain and spinal cord. So much so that if we were to just dissolve away everything except the nervous system, if we had a human nervous system splayed out here on the table in front of us, it would look like a human being. There would be a connection at every level down to, you'd be able to say that's the big toe and that's the pinky and that's where the heart would belong because it's almost like a silhouette of our entire body. Oh. And so when we think about the nervous system, it's really important I think for people to understand that the nervous system is all of that, brain and body and all the connections back and forth. And you know, there have been thousands of years of debates about what's the mind, what's the brain, et cetera, the mind-body problem, all that. I think it's fair to say in 2020 that states of mind include the brain, the activity of the brain and the body. Those two things coordinate, the brain and the body and have a sort of what I call a contract. There's a brain body contract mm -hmm. that gives rise to things like states of mind. So a feeling of depression or a feeling of awe or excitement or happiness. Which is a state of mind is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, I, I mean, we could talk about why. An, an, ex why, an emotional I, experience is a state of mind. That's right. Yeah. I, I prefer to talk about states and states of mind because they include the brain and body. So just by saying mind, I don't mean just brain. They include the brain and body. And also because... So when you, may, when you say, sorry to interrupt, but no. brain and body mean thought and feeling? Yeah, so you're asking the key questions. Um, emotions are very hard to describe in an objective way. Whereas right. states have certain properties that allow us to study them in different laboratories and from one experiment to the next. So um, some people may have heard this before, but we really, the brain does really five things. We have mm -hmm. sensation, yep. which is, you know, we're constantly being bombarded with sound waves and light yes. and smells and things. And that stuff is ongoing and you can't negotiate that. It's yeah. just you have these receptors in your body that allow you to, 
evaluate those things. A sea turtle has magnetoreception. It can navigate by magnetic fields. Wow. We cannot do that, but they can because they sense it. Mm -hmm. You know, infrared vision in a pit viper or something. So unless you put on, you know, night vision goggles, you can't do that. Then there's perception, which is which sensations you are paying attention to. So as you write with your pen, if I say, what does that pen feel like in your hand? Mm -hmm. Now you're perceiving it. But right. the sensation was always there. Those receptors were always sensing it. So the sensation being the actual feeling or the actual visual, the perception is your interpretation of the feeling? Ah, uh, so... I would say that the perceptions are where your attention is, which sensations you're attending to. And then you have thoughts. And thoughts get a little complicated for us to parse because they are a little bit abstract. But thoughts are a combination of our perception, whatever it is we're attending to, and they have context, memory. You know, they're tapped into our, you know, they're tapped yeah. into our memory systems, right? Because if I say a pen and you're like, for, I don't know what your relationship to pens is, but mine is kind of a trivial one. I write with one. But let's say I come from a family that, I don't know, had a pen factory in Germany in the 1930s. Then there's a or, whole... Or you got stabbed by a pen when you were stabbed by a pen, right. So it, it's very contextual. Yeah. So thoughts are like perceptions, but they carry memory and context. Thoughts are memory and context. Yeah, they include that. And then there are feelings slash emotions. And this is where it really starts to get abstract and kind yeah. of hazy and where there's still a lot of debate. Because for instance, if I ask you how you're feeling and you say, I feel, most people say, I feel good. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that's mm -hmm. not a feeling. So if you ever do personal development work, they're always like, don't use a, don't say good or bad. What do you feel? And people will say, well, I feel calm and excited or something mm -hmm. like, you know, when it, and it starts becoming very abstract. And so, Emotions are a real thing, yep. and they certainly, perhaps more than anything else, recruit the brain and the body. When we feel depressed, we, we occupy certain postures, mm -hmm. we feel it in our gut, we feel it in our limbs, we can feel fatigue, we can feel anxious, and so the, the emotions are really where you capture that mind, the brain-body contract and relationship very, very intensely. Okay. And then the fifth thing is actions. And what I love about actions and behaviors is they are very concrete. You're writing with your pen now, I'm speaking, I'm moving my hands. You can measure those things, you can analyze them, we know exactly what the neural pathways are. So we've got sensation, perception, emotions, and actions. Thoughts, yep. And then of course, beneath all that, you've got memories and um, people always like to raise intuition. You know, they always say, what about that sixth thing, intuition? And we could talk about intuition, but the reason I like to talk about states and the reason we study states in my lab is that states have two properties that are easy to study somewhat compared to emotions. And that's how pervasive they are, meaning how long lasting they are. States tend to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Whereas emotions, it's sort of like they, they're more in combination. States are more like the primary colors from which you mix mm -hmm. all the, you, the, you get all the emotions. Yeah. And the other thing is that they have an intensity that we can measure. You can have a state of being very alert or very drowsy or asleep. And you can say from a one to 10, how are you feeling in this state? That's right, and we can how measure much is that it. that experience, that, yeah. That's right, and we can correlate it with things like heart rate, heart rate variability, breathing speed, sweating, mm -hmm. levels of neural activity in brain areas that control wakefulness. And so mm. I will be the first to say that I would love to be able to say that in my laboratory, we are studying or someday we'll study awe and flow and all those things, but those are higher up on the ladder than we can get to right now. I think with the current technology, we can understand states and from there, I do believe that we can make a significant dent into certain mental health issues mm. and optimize performance in certain you know communities that are trying to optimize performance yeah. and in the general public. But the, th the states that we're focused on are very concrete. For instance, alert and focused. That would be a wonderful state to understand and be able to direct ourselves toward when we're not feeling alert and focused. How but to get into that how state. How to get into that state. And we could talk about tools for that if you like. Sleep. Sleep is so powerful and so important. I think now people really understand mm -hmm. the extent to which it's important in large part because of Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep, and mm -hmm. the important work that he's done in his lab at Berkeley and many other labs as well, of course. So focus, sleep creativity, stress. These are the, the kind of core states that we would like to tackle first because we believe we can. Mm. And then hopefully in my career, but if not in my career, then maybe one of my scientific offspring or another <laughs> laboratory, you know, 10, 20, 100 years from now, we'll be able to understand things like, how does one get into a state of um, empathy? 
Like, mm -hmm. I mean, we could spend the whole hour talking about empathy, but it's hard and it's a fascinating topic and it's so important, but it's just very hard to understand at a neural level. So we're starting with the basics, Got it. with the confidence that by understanding those basics, mm -hmm. they will build up to richer representations and understanding of things like empathy someday. Yeah. Would you need to be studying the heart as well to understand empathy? Or does it all come from the mind? It's a great question. So we, to understand any state, a, we believe that you have to study the brain and the spinal cord and the body. Wow. So in my lab, you know, we talk about being neuroscientists. For me, that means we study the nervous system, the whole thing. So people who come into my laboratory, we put them into VR environments that simulate some experience. And I realize it's not as real as being in the actual experience in the real world, but you get enough presence especially because it's very visually and auditory, auditorily rich mm -hmm. in those environments, people get what's called presence. They, they forget that they're in a VR environment, mm -hmm. at least for moments. And in that time, we're measuring heart rate variability, we're measuring sweating, we're measuring, in many cases, we also have electrodes lowered into their brain because we do this with neurosurgery patients. And so we have access to the brain, we have access to the body, and it's really by recording from all these areas of the brain and body that we can get a fuller understanding of what a state of say focus or stress or anxiety really is. If we were just looking in one little corner of the brain or just in just at the heart, right. we wouldn't be able to do that. And so that's a kind of a, a centerpiece of our lab is that brain and body, the whole nervous system is, is the key. You gotta look at all of it. With, with, with feelings, I wanna talk about feelings and emotions for a second. Can a person make it so they never get depressed? They never react to um, their perception, their people's actions towards them where they never get to a state of, ah, uh, I don't feel good, I'm feeling more depressed, I'm in a, a dark place now, I'm stuck in this place. Is there a way that we could ever defend ourselves against negative stressors, negative emotions? Or are we just, are they, do we need them as well to have contrast yeah. in life? Well, there's sort of two views on this. Um, I'll reveal mine after I um, sort of uh, explain the two views. One is that these states, uh, I guess I'm, I'm automatically calling things like depression a state of mind state and of body. Mind. It, so when I say state of mind, I mean brain and body. Because your body is really feeling, it's like the brain is connected to the body. Right. And so if you're saying internally the thought of like, I'm depressed, or I don't feel good, or I'm sad, or I'm lonely, or I'm not good enough, the body's going to react. Is that what I'm understanding? Absolutely. Like the body's going to manifest what the mind is telling you. Absolutely. The thought, the idea, you're gonna be like, I'm sad, I'm not good enough, you're gonna shrink. Right. Is that right? That's right. I mean, there are really two forms of depression. Um, sometimes they're intermixed, but one is anxiety-associated depression. And you, you, if you've ever experienced it, or for anyone that's experienced it, they feel agitation in their body. And their mind races, but in their body. So the body is recruited. There are also depressive states that people feel very fatigued and exhausted it's an overwhelm. And they also experience that in their body. The, the idea of getting out of bed in the morning is hard, um, motivating to exercise, doing the sorts of things that we know are powerful for pushing back on depression. Mm -hmm. So the body is recruited. I think most people would say that depressive states are bad when they bring down the baseline on life. I, just to, as a brief aside, anytime there's a question about mental health or addiction or trauma, or anything, one could look at it and make up some argument of, low well, evolutionarily, this makes sense, we all get depressed, but we have to be fair to the person experiencing it, of course, and have sensitivity that some behaviors will keep the baseline of our life steady, meaning job, relationships, et cetera, will continue as they are. Other activities will tend to improve the baseline on our life, job, activities, relationship, et cetera, will, will improve. And then there's some things like heroin, which, does very quickly, we can predict that very quickly the baseline on life is gonna creep down regardless of who that person is, mm -hmm. right? So people say, can you get addicted to water? Well, maybe, but I have to drink a lot of water before the baseline on my life starts to go down. So it sure. just feels uncomfortable. That's it's right. It's like, man, I'm so bloated. Exactly. All <laughs> right. So we tend to throw around things like addiction and depression a little loosely. So yeah. I, I think that it's fair to say that depression is wired into us as a possible state that we can all fall into, but that it's very important in my opinion that humans have tools to remove themselves from that state mm -hmm. 
of course, to avoid you know, tragedies like suicide, but also because when the baseline on someone's life goes down far enough, they find it increasingly hard to do the sorts of things that are going to get them out of depression. So you or I could say... So they stay in that state of depression because right. oh, it's too hard to go work out. It's too hard to change my habit right. of eating healthier. So I'm going to stay... Uh, I'm going to keep eating ice cream, which is going to make my body you know, depressed. That's right. Right? If I That's keep right. eating bad foods, if I keep staying up till 4 a.m., if I keep staying in a toxic relationship, I'm going to feel depressed. That's right. And eventually, because of this very... Um, inseparable relationship between the brain and body, eventually what happens is that because the brain controls the body, but also the body can control the brain, mm. people lose the ability to intervene in this depressive process. So you or I could say, look, if someone who's depressed, they what they need to do is get up early, get some light in their eyes, yes. um, get some movement. I know you've put this information out there, which I love because these the, those tips are grounded in, I'll, I'll, they're not even tips, they're really tools. Yes. And they're very powerful because they're grounded in excellent science. You get that dopamine release early in the day that's antidepressive. You time your sleep better when you get sun in your eyes and you get movement early in the day. For most people, that's accessible and they should be, they absolutely should be doing it. Everyone should be doing that. But for people who are far enough down that path of depression, because the body and the mind have this relationship that's so close, it, there is a crossover point where they really can't do those activities. Because they're so far deep in the depression. The body won't do what they decide to do. And so, now I'm not trying to give anyone a pass because ultimately we are all responsible for our own mental health. Certainly adults more mm -hmm. than kids, but you know we're all responsible for our own mental health and only we can direct our own brain changes. That's, yes. the, that's the stinger. Mm. Once we're you know 25 years and older, we are the only ones that can change our brain. And we can talk about neuroplasticity if you like, but the depressed person has to take responsibility for their behavior. But this is why it's so important to catch this brain-body relationship early and build routines that keep one out of depression. So that was a long path back mm -hmm. to answer your question succinctly, I hope, which is we can stay out of depression, but we have to keep depression at bay by doing things regularly. The same mm -hmm. way we can stay out of obesity by eating the right foods in the right times and ratios and things of that sort. But once one is obese, there are massive endocrine changes, type two diabetes that make it hard to eat correctly. Right. Right. So there's this it's hard to get out of it. It's hard to go back to a healthy state. That's right. Once your insulin is dysregulated, you're hungry all the time. So it's much harder to control your hunger. Now, and you have to have so much discipline and willpower to, I guess, break through and try to get back to a healthier state. That's right. Is that right? It's That's possible right. is what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. But it's really, really hard. That's right. So is depression a disease then? Are, are, are people who have certain brain chemistry that are born differently with their brains that are just more depressed? Or is it possible to get out of that state if you have the functionality to think, to act, to you know, move, to create routines and habits for yourself, is that possible? Yeah, uh, there are some genetic predispositions to depression. And there's certainly familial circumstances where you know, trauma and challenge that can right. head people down that path. I think you know, one of the reasons I'm involved in public education about neuroscience is I, I want people to understand the nervous system and I want them to understand that there are tools that can allow them to intervene in their thoughts and feelings. And most of the time those involve bringing in behaviors and the actual actions, which are very concrete. And the, the reason is the following. It's very hard to control the mind just using thinking. It's just, just using the mind. Just thinking. It's very hard to, you know, if someone's stressed out and you say, calm down, it doesn't work. <laughs> Telling ourselves calm down doesn't work. So it's like, right? what's a tool? Breathe. Right. So, right. So a specific Go tool. Go outside for a walk. A specific yeah. tool, right? And when it comes to depression and emotions, I mean, the, it's very hard to talk oneself out of an emotional state. It's just very challenging. It's very hard. That's right. It's, but it's like when I talk to my girlfriend and she's just like, she's not happy about something and she gets on a tangent. I'm like, there's nothing I can say to calm her down. There's nothing I can say to, to someone who's emotional mm -hmm. about an idea in the moment mm -hmm. until I'm like, okay, let's talk later. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, me trying to tell them to relax, you know, that's not what it's you're thinking. It's counterproductive. Not what, you know, it's not the truth. That's not what you're thinking or whatever. It's kind of reactive, right? Yeah. It makes them <laughs> more emotional. Well, that's because st these states, like these emotional oh. states of mind, they, they recruit the whole nervous system. So we are actually wow. a different... So your whole body is 
out of control. Your mind, your body. Like for instance, if you're angry, upset, or stressed, your pupils dilate. This is subconscious. As a consequence, <laughs> as a consequence of that, you view the world in pan in a kind of like portrait mode, not panoramic, excuse me, portrait mode on your phone, where the thing that's upsetting you is in sharper focus and everything else is blurry. So you actually see the world differently. In addition to that, the timing, uh, that your perception of time, excuse me, is now faster so that things outside you seem to be moving more slowly in comparison to how you feel inside. You've experienced this if you were ever in line at the airport or something and it's taking a long time and you're about to miss your flight, it seems like the person in front of you is moving very slow. They're taking forever. Yeah, but yeah. time is time. It's, you know, it's moving at the same rate regardless. When you're very calm, or let's say you're, you're fatigued, let's say you're exhausted, you didn't sleep well the night before, things in front of you are gonna seem like they're moving really fast. They're saying, take off your shoes, putting them on the conveyor, do it. And it's kind of overwhelming. Like, slow down here. That's right, because your internal <laughs> clock is moving more slowly. Yeah. And so these states of mind, when someone's upset, they, they recruit their entire being, their way of being. And so one of the reasons why I mentioned that sensation, perception, feeling, thought, and action before is that the actions are very concrete and because of this reciprocal relationship between the brain and body, brain connects to body, body connects to brain, we know that when the mind isn't where we want it to be, we need to use the body to intervene. What does that mean? So there are two ways that you can shift your brain state quickly. You mentioned one already, which is respiration or breathing. And the reason is there's a direct connection from the brain to an organ in our body called the diaphragm, which is skeletal muscle. The diaphragm is designed to move the lungs up and down, bring in more oxygen, expel more oxygen. And it's unlike other organs like the heart or the spleen or the liver because it's actually made up of what's called striated muscle, just like a bicep, tricep, or quadricep. It can be voluntarily controlled. You can't voluntarily control your heart directly right now. Like you can't say speed up and speed it up. Or slow down. Or slow it down. But you can slow down your breathing you can do and you can slow down the way you think about things, I'm assuming or change your thought to something else to help you be more relaxed. That's right. So one of the reasons why breathing is such a powerful tool for shifting one's state is that A, it's always available for voluntary control. It's just right there. You can, I can decide right now to do three inhales or I can just go back to breathing reflexively. I can just do that in any moment. So the, the neural you know, real estate, which is in the brainstem that controls breathing is in a unique position because it's at the kind of boundary between conscious control and unconscious control. I can't do that for my digestion. I can't do that for most, most everything that happens internally. The other thing is that breathing controls our level of alertness very dramatically. So the faster you breathe, generally, the more alert you are. The slower you breathe, the more calm you're gonna be. The faster you breathe meaning shorter quick breaths or? <sighs> Either way. So, um, so we're just to take a brief um, adventure through the, the neuroscience of breathing and how it relates to brain states. And, and there's some fun tools in here, so forgive me for this tangent, but you have two brain areas that are responsible for breathing. One is called, for the aficionados, the pre Singer complex. It was discovered by Jack Feldman at UCLA. It's named after a bottle of wine, so now you won't, people won't forget it. <laughs> and it controls rhythmic breathing. So inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. It's just rhythmic breathing. There's another brain area that controls breathing which is near what's called the parafacial nucleus, which involves breathing anytime there are double inhales or double exhales or triple inhales. And you say, well, why would you have this second brain area for breathing? Well, it turns out when you're speaking or crying or coughing, you need to coordinate your breathing with your speaking. And that means sometimes you need to take multiple inhales or multiple exhales, and this is all happening very, very fast. You don't notice. But there's a very important discovery that was made a few years ago by Jack's lab and by a guy named Mark Krasno at Stanford who discovered there's a set of neurons in your brainstem, my brainstem, everybody's brainstem, and every animal, every mammal's brainstem. It's a very small number of neurons that controls a specific pattern of breathing, which are called physiological size. So these are not just size where you go and exhale. These are size that involve doing two inhales and then an extended exhale. We all do this. You do this during sleep. Anytime carbon dioxide levels in your bloodstream get too high, in order to get more oxygen into your system. People also do this if they've been crying or sobbing, they'll do this and then they'll exhale. So what's happening with these physiological sides and why is this powerful? So your lungs are two big bags of air, but they actually are made up of a ton of little sacks of air called the alveoli of the lungs. 
when we are exercising or when we are sleeping or anytime we're doing anything, these, these little sacks of air eventually start to collapse. And what happens is carbon dioxide builds up in our system and we experience that as stress. We actually feel the impulse to breathe because carbon dioxide levels get too high. They're neurons that sense carbon dioxide. And then without realizing it, you do a double inhale and then exhale. Typically the inhales are done through the nose and the exhale is done through the mouth. So it looks like, and why the second inhale? Well, if you've ever um, tried to blow up a balloon for a kid at a kid's party or just blown up a balloon, you sometimes blow into that empty balloon. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. So time. what do you do? You do two in, you do two, you go and then it pops open. So these double inhales pop open the alveoli of the lungs. Huh. They don't explode them, but they pop them open, which pulls carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream, brings oxygen, and then you offload carbon dioxide. So if you watch a dog right before it takes a nap or something, it often will do these. Now what's cool about these physiological size is from work in our lab and that's still ongoing, I just wanna say it's still ongoing, but work in other labs as well, double inhales followed by an extended exhale are the fastest way that I'm aware of to bring the mind and the body into a more relaxed no way. state. No Really? Yeah. It, the it only, fastest way. The so fastest if I'm stressed, way. I'm overwhelmed, just do a three or two? Two inhales through the nose and then exhale slow through the mouth. One to three of those repeated will bring your level of autonomic arousal down basically to baseline. What's the autonomic? It's called a, it, so, autonomic sorry, arousal, sorry, what was it? Sorry, so the autonomic nervous system, it just autonomic. means automatic. Yeah, it just means uh, automatic. And it's a misnomer because as I'm describing, it's not all automatic. I'm sorry, so autonomic arousal is kind of your level of alertness okay. or your level of calm. People sometimes call it sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic. Got I it. avoid sympathetic, parasympathetic, because sympathetic sounds like sympathy. Uh -huh. And then people think it means calm and nice when it actually means stress and Sympathetic out. is stress. Exactly. The naming- Parasympathetic is non-stress. That's right. And, and those names have to do with the anatomy and the locations of the neurons involved sure, in them. Sure. But, but I think for anyone that experiences anxiety from time to time, which is everybody, knowing that you can consciously take control over these neurons that control the ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the lungs, et cetera. Even if you don't remember any of that, it's just two inhales through the nose. What you're trying to do is maximally inflate those little sacs in your lungs and then exhale long through the mouth because you're blowing off carbon dioxide. I heard you do a, does it matter the cadence? Because you did a long deep breath and then a shorter? Not so much. That's just your style. Yeah, you're just trying to fill those, those as big as you can. So the advice that we hear of take a deep breath or yeah. just exhale is sort of right but it doesn't capture huh. the, the, this neural circuit. So a lot of what my lab is focused on, because there's so many great labs and people doing great stuff in the breathwork community, Patrick McEwen, Brian McKenzie, there, there are all these incredible people doing this work, Wim Hof, yeah. but my lab's been mainly focused on what is the neural machinery that controls these brain body states. And the reason these physiological sides work is partially because you offload carbon dioxide, you reinflate the lungs, so when the body has oxygen, it's happy. When it ha doesn't have oxygen, it gets stressed. But the other reason is the most direct and fastest connection between the brain and body for controlling your state of mind is what's called the phrenic nerve, P-H-R-E-N-I-C. The phrenic nerve connects these neurons that I'm referring to in these two brain centers that control breathing with the diaphragm. Huh. A lot of people get excited about the vagus nerve and I'm not out to punish the vagus nerve or the veganistas, <laughs> But the truth is the vagus nerve is a very slow system for calming the brain and body. It's called the rest and digest pathway. Mm -hmm. People are engaging their vagus all the time when they eat a big meal. When the stomach is distended, it sends a signal to the brain that, oh, I have enough food, it's time to Relax. rest and digest. But eating, first of all, if you're only using food as a way to control your stress. That's not a good habit. It's not a good habit. <laughs> and and you'll, be, you'll be depressed once. That's right. People have l learned long ago, thousands of years ago, that the best way to suppress a cortisol response is with carbohydrates because it blunts cortisol. But this is why people eat carbohydrate rich foods when they're stressed. And when cortisol is spiked, what happens? So every morning when you wake up, there's a cortisol spike. That's a good cortisol spike. That's a stress spike, spike right? That's, it's like a... It's a good one. It's the one that wakes you up out of sleep and you want that early in the day. So you're not just like groggy all day, right? That's right. Like, okay, I'm cortisol all right. has important positive health promoting functions. There's a signature of depression and anxiety, however, that the psychiatrists know about, which is a 9 p.m. cortisol spike. There, are, for people who are depressed, there's a second spike of cortisol late in the day. 
And that's problematic and is associated with a lot of mental health issues. And cortisol is a stress hormone, is that right? Cortisol is a stress hormone. So you have your adrenal glands, which are right above your kidneys and your lower back, and they, adre- they have there are two parts to it. They release adrenaline, which is also called epinephrine. And adrenaline is what makes you feel agitated. What's you, you know, if you're calm, you're walking along, you look at your phone and there's a troubling text message, you immediately have focus, energy, and alertness. Is the brain connected to those then? And yeah. it sends a signal to each other? That's right. Was, That's really? Right. Exactly. And then it affects the body. That's right. Two and then the body highway. feels it. That's right. So adrenaline is liberated into the body very fast in less than a second, half of 500 milliseconds. You see something, second. you're reacting to it, That's and right. it's just boom. That's right. And it recruits a set of neurons that live right in the core of your body. They then send a signal out to your body, and all of a sudden, you feel like you want to move. And the stress is just, it, it's going to dilate your pupils, cue your alertness, and make you agitated wow. and want to move. The body's pretty fascinating. It's really fascinating. And you want this because, you know, um, the other night I was taking a hike. Um, I was out here a couple days ago and, and taking a hike in Topanga. And I saw a shadow. I looked down and it didn't move. It was a snake. I, it wasn't a rattlesnake. But, but still, all that happened in less than a second, right? And these are primitive pathways designed to get you to your alertness. Your, my night vision is so-so, but all of a sudden I felt like I could see clearly. And you just... That's adrenaline. Cortisol is a bit more slow acting. So when that adrenaline is up over and over and over again for days and days, cortisol starts getting liberated from also from the adrenals. It comes from other places too, but mainly from the adrenals. And the cortisol system is an anti-inflammation system as well as an inflammation system, but it's both. It's both. But people, you know, they give cortisone shots to football right, players right. At, you know, in the locker room for a here. reason. Um, it blocks pain and all these things. So the- But too much of it over an extended period of time does what? It can cause chronic inflammation. It can cause chronic fatigue. I mean, there is a debate out there. Most serious MDs don't believe in adrenal burnout. People think of adrenal burnout. There is something Adrenal called, fatigue or adrenal burnout. So there is something called adrenal insufficiency syndrome, which is a real medical phenomenon where the adrenals are incapable of making these cortisol and adrenal hormones. But the the truth is that you have enough adrenaline and cortisol in your body to last two lifetimes and 25 famines. I mean, we were built with a lot of robustness, right? <laughs> right. This explains, you know, that, you know, the David Goggins of the world, they, yeah. they, they, you know, we, ha- we all do have that greater capacity that people talk about. The stress is very misunderstood because people think of stress as this ancient carryover that's very unfortunate. It kind of gets lumped with depression. Like, oh, this is just a, a, f- a flaw in our design or something. But actually, stress is wonderful. It actually activates our immune system. So mm. anytime you liberate adrenaline into your bloodstream, you also protect yourself against infection of bacteria and viruses. Because if you think about it, if we had to gather food and we didn't have it, and we had to then pack up and you know migrate long distances, you can't afford to get sick. And this is why people who work, 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 and then rest, they usually get sick when they finally stop and rest. Really? Yeah, it's like the post-finals phenomenon in university or after the season for a game or the caretaker's thing where you're taking care of somebody who's ill and you're just work, work, work or taking care of young children and then you finally stop to rest, you go on vacation and you get slammed with, with an illness. Why is that? Because you're being in your comfort zone now? or you're it's because st- stress turned off. And adrenaline, huh? so that these the stress response recruits the immune organs of the body to release killer T cells. In fact, Wim Hof breathing, I know you're familiar mm-hmm. with Wim, the, of doing 20 or 30 deep inhales and exhales, and also combined with some breath hold type work, exhale mm-hmm. hold, inhale hold, is known to stimulate adrenaline release. And the one of the better papers that's out there, scientific peer reviewed papers, is a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they brought in two groups. Um, one group um, did Wim Hof breathing, the other group did just uh, mindful meditation. Both groups were injected with E. coli. Right? <laughs> this is crazy. Right? This is uh, crazy. Right? It's crazy. The meditators got fever, diarrhea, and and, um, and vomiting. And the people who did Wim Hof th- either didn't get it or got it to a much lesser it felt extent. Sluggish, but That's not. Right. They didn't. Right. Isn't that this crazy? This is not an experiment to do at home. Isn't this but, crazy? But it makes perfect sense because it inc- that breathing simulates a stress response. It stimulates cortisol and adrenaline, which signals which to the- protects the body. Right, which signals to the thymus, the spleen, and the other, you know, the, the, the nodes of the immune system to liberate killer cells. And so when that bacteria comes in, the system is ready for it. 
They're def- yeah. Your body is defending against viruses that's and right. disease, that's essentially. Right. When, Going you, to, when you create a routine of healthy stress. That's right. And, and we could talk about, we definitely want to, you don't want stress on all the time. Sleep is really important, et cetera. But that stress response combats infection because it recruits immune cells. Now, I, I want to be really clear because there's been a lot of discussion about that study out there, most of which is totally wrong. And the I'm Wim Hof not, breathing study? Well, or the... Uh, the study was done correctly. Uh-huh. Um, but when people re- recap that study and summarize it, oftentimes they'll say it suppressed the immune response, that people were able to suppress the immune response. And, the, and that's absolutely mm. wrong. What does it's, that mean, suppress the immune response? Well, exactly. It doesn't make any sense. What, what that did was, and if you look at the graphs in that paper, which I've done, what it did is it stimulated cortisol release. It stimulated adrenaline release or epinephrine release so that the system was primed to battle infection. Wow. And so I think it, it's a very impressive thing. And, and you know, hats off to Wim for discovering and thinking about a way to recruit the what's called the innate immune system. Before that study, it was thought that you couldn't really recruit the immune system in that way. Now, you don't have to do that breathing you could if you like, but you don't have to do that breathing to recruit the immune response. What else could you do? A cold shower or an ice bath is another way to induce stress. <laughs> Which is what he right? does Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so I think that, um, you know, when you look at states of stress, I mean, there, cold water is one way to do it. Um, intense, what's the breathing that they do, that sort of Wim Hof breathing is also classically called Tumo breathing. It's kind of the opposite of the physiological side that I described, the double inhale, exhale, Mm because it's not designed to to reduce stress. It's actually designed to increase your level of alertness. And it's interesting because a lot of people find great relief from stress by doing this Tumo type Wim Hof intense breathing once a day. Now, the reason I suggest physiological size is they can be done in real time. You can get into the elevator and do a physiological size. You could also do Tumo type breathing. In any moment you can do a... Right, exactly. Whereas the more intense forms of breathing are more of a practice that you do. Yeah, might you take could, 10, 20 minutes. Right. Or, yeah. they, what they tend to do and what cold showers and ice baths and things like that do is they raise the ceiling on your stress threshold. And what I mean by that is throughout the day and throughout the year, we're confronted with different things. Right now, we're confronted with a lot of things. Yeah. 2020 <laughs> is the year of being confronted with stress of various kinds. The mind plays an important role in interpreting whether or not it's overwhelming or tolerable. So intense breathing like tumo breathing or ice baths or cold showers or intense exercise like you know high intensity interval training type stuff teaches the mind to be comfortable in these higher stress states where in other words, it teaches people to be comfortable when they have a lot of adrenaline in their body. Mm. This is like, this is basically stress inoculation. But stress inoculation is not about not getting stressed. It's actually about divorcing the mind-body relationship a bit. But at the end of the day, what I'm hearing you say is you can control the mind, the body or the mind with the mind to an extent for for moments or even extended periods of time, hours maybe. But really we need to be thinking the mind and the body connection at all times. That's right. Because if you stop breathing, if you're or if you're only doing short breaths the whole time for a whole day, it's going to affect the body right. and the mind. And if you're, um, so it's it's using the body, using the breath, using it where it's connected to the brain to constantly support you throughout the day. But if you're just like <laughs> all day, it'll help you get to a certain point, but then it'll be detrimental to your health. Right. So these these breathing practices are about shifting the gears. But yes. they're not something that you continue doing throughout all your day. day. Yeah. Really what I've described here are hardwired, meaning we were all born mm-hmm. with these neurons and connections in our body. We were all born with these organs to be able to do these things. We, there's not a lot of learning involved. <clears throat> Once you know how to do it, it works the first time, it works every time. Yes. But it's sort of like shifting gears. Uh, there aren't too many manual transmissions these days. But let's say you're driving <laughs> down downhill and it's going too fast. You would. If This is like taking it into a a lower gear, so then you slow down. You're not gonna constantly be riding the clutch, right? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna constantly be in the shifting mode or riding the brake. Some people do that, but that's not good, (laughs) right? You don't wanna have to do that. Just like if you're going uphill, you might have to hit on the gas a little bit, otherwise you're not gonna get up that hill, but at some point, you switch gears, and then you're just cruising up the hill, right? So it's a transmission system, Mm. rather than you're supposed to breathe this way all day or breathe that way all day. This is smart. the, the fast breathing followed by exhales and breath holds 
the super oxygenation, Tumo, Wim Hof type breathing. Uh -huh. I look at that as learning how to drive on, um, on a s slick pavement. You know, it, it's, it's self-induced stress. It's like taking your car to a, a parking lot. You know, when you, a kid's learning to drive, I was teaching a kid to drive recently. You teach them to drive, you go through the neighborhood, you do things, but when you really want to learn how to, for instance, drive through puddles or mm -hmm. drive in fog or drive in heavy rain, you kind of want to be in a parking lot or a, a, safe, environment. a safe environment for that. You don't want to be on a, you know, on the Autobahn, people, right? <laughs> so you, these are ways in which you can teach yourself how to navigate the bad weather of the, yes. of the nervous system. So you're prepared for when it comes. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and I have to say from personal experience and from some emerging data, when I say emerging data, I mean studies in my lab and other labs that are still ongoing, it does appear that when people self-induce this stress, it can be beneficial for, I'm gonna quote a colleague of mine, my colleague David Spiegel, who's our associate chair of psychiatry says, it's not just about the state that you're in, the state of mind that you're in, it's how you got there and whether mm. or not you had anything to do with it. Mm. So when you self-induce stress and then you say, oh, I can calm my mind even though my body is feeling agitated, that's a very positive experience for mm -hmm. many people. Whereas when someone else is causing your stress and you're trying to calm down, it feels like you're battling 25 different things. Yeah. So these are skills that anyone can develop. Um, and they are skills that essentially require information of what to do, but zero training. I mean, so it's like, I'm sure you played football. I didn't, uh -huh. you can probably, I'm certain you can throw a football way better than I can. <laughs> That took some some learning. Yeah. It would take me a long, long time, maybe forever, to be able to try and approximate <laughs> that skill level. But these are things that we can all do right away. Yeah, yeah. And so now I think we've kind of spelled out a, a two tools on either side. Physiological size for, for calming down in real time. Exhale emphasized breathing of the yoga nidra sort, maybe even doing yoga nidra 10 to 20 or 30 minutes a couple times a week daily if you want to teach your nervous system to calm down and then also having tools that emphasize inhales so longer more vigorous inhales mm -hmm. <clears throat> or doing an offline practice of some point during your day you decide i'm going to do five or ten minutes of this more rapid breathing followed by some breath holds yeah and provided those are designated safe for you the 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 super oxygenated breathing you decide is safe for you I'm not aware of any dangers of the exhale emphasized breathing at all, um, but people should always approach any new thing with caution, of course. But once you have those four tools in hand, you've really learned how to press on the accelerator, so that's inhaling more than you exhale. You've learned how to drive faster, be comfortable at higher speeds. That's kind of like the Wim Hof type breathing. Mm -hmm. You're comfortable at high speeds. It's like, oh, I'm, I can drive 65 and feel calm. I'm yeah. good here, whereas previously you couldn't as well as learning how to slow down by with the physiological side, that's sort of a break. And then the yoga nidra is sort of like coming off the accelerator mm, to slow down. Yeah. You're just turning off your system. The beauty of having these different tools and practicing them now and again is that there's this other phenomenon, which is neuroplasticity, which is that then you start doing it reflexively without even realizing it. You start doing physiological size when you're too stressed. But automatically. Automatically, and even before you start to hit the alertness Threshold, where you, yeah. People just start to engage these things, and so it's kind of like when you see a dog who's just tired. It, it automatically does this sigh when it's like panting, and it'll do yeah. like a big sigh, yeah. and then it's like almost like it's relaxed, That's right? And it's just like it That's goes right. to sleep. That's right. I see this with my dog all the time. It's they, like running around panting, and then it's just like <sighs> exactly. And that <laughs> little extra inhale. I know we've talked a lot about this before, but I don't think we can overemphasize the power of the physiological sigh because that little extra inhale is what opens up those little sacs in the lungs just a little bit more, and that when you exhale, it pulls a lot more carbon dioxide out of the system. Which, when you pull carbon dioxide out of the system, what does that do? You feel calm. Wow, in there you go. You feel calm, in fact. So it's a physiological yeah. mechanism to make you calm. That's right. And in fact, um, you know, in claustrophobic environments, or God forbid, if you're, you know, you're drowning, the reason you're stressed is because you have neurons in your brainstem that sense carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. And as that goes up, it says you need to find air, you need to offload this carbon dioxide. Oh man. So it's, it's a re these are all real physiological mechanisms that are really about balancing the oxygen and carbon dioxide in your system. And when we see these really extreme feats of breath holds and people doing all these really wild things, usually it's because they're learning to manipulate 
the oxygen carbon dioxide packing or ratios or how they manage them. Free divers get very good at this. There's air packing. There's all sorts of dangerous stuff that should only really be done by highly trained, highly skilled people. But, you know, once people have these tools in hand, they can start coupling to them to the tools that involve the mind. I mean, it's fine to do a physiological sigh and to tell yourself to calm down. We're not saying don't think or be mindless. Right. But, but what we're saying is it's it's powerful to look to these mechanics of the body-mind relationship. And you said the body and the mind are connected. It's really a two-way street. Mm-hmm. You know, the mind controls the body, the body controls the mind. It's a loop. I just think of it like a loop. Yeah. I don't even think of it as one controlling the other. It's just if one of those things is out of whack, you, ne- you need to control the other one. Mm-hmm. Right? You're not gonna try and, just think about trying to control your mind and again is like grabbing at fog or at smoke. It's, uh, it just moves <laughs> away. So that most of the time. I wanna ask you a question, I wanna shift gears in a, in a, in a strategic way. Um, and I love to have practitioners, scientists, doctors, um, researchers who are into the practicality of things. But I also love to have philosophers, spiritual leaders, and manifestors, like I call, people that are talking about the law of attraction Mm -hmm. and the way we think and how our thoughts allow us to attract the things we want in our life, whether it be a positive thing or something they don't want, but our thoughts really start to attract. And I wanna understand the science of the law of attraction. Oh my, okay. Because I recently had the author of The Secret, which has kind of made the law of attraction more mainstream and popularized. This is something that's been around for a long time. The uh, manifesting your thoughts and the law of attraction is not a new thing, but she popularized it with The Secret, Rhonda Byrne. And as I was interviewing her, and I've interviewed a lot of different experts who talk about the law of attraction, it's always been fascinating to hear the results they get in their life based on using this principle called the law of attraction or thinking of certain things that you want, desiring certain things that you want as if it's already happened, imagining as if you already have it, Mm -hmm. visualizing it, and also acting. It's not just thinking and it comes to you, but thinking, manifesting, attracting the people you need in your life for it to, to manifest, taking the actions necessary, learning the skills. But as opposed to having a mind of chaos, it's hard to manifest what we want under a mind of chaos. Mm -hmm. But when we're clearer, we start to manifest those things with a process. Can you break down the science of the law of attraction? Oh my. Uh, and, uh, and, and why this idea of thinking a certain thing will manifest, why that is accurate or not? So I, I confess I'm not super familiar with it, although I've yes. heard about it. it um, so law of attraction essentially just being uh, what you think you become, what you think you create, what you, what you think about consistently, you'll start to attract in your life. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the baseline principle. There's more to it, but I'm simplifying it. Okay. So when we think about something consistently in our minds, is there science around this that uh, validates or doesn't validate that we start to, in the physical world, attract our thoughts? Oh, okay. Whether it be a negative thought about hmm. what I don't want, or a thought around what I do want. It's almost like saying, okay, when you think about a pink elephant, you, you see it everywhere. Right. Is, this, is there science to this? So, um, well, I can't give a uh, intelligent answer about the, the law of attraction specifically, but what I can perhaps do is shed some light on what we think we know, what neuroscientists think we know mm-hmm. about um, how thoughts and thinking actually work and how those relate to behaviors. And then I'll give a little anecdote that um, Sweet. that uh, I think people might appreciate because it's something that I keep in mind a lot in thinking about goal setting and mm. focus and okay. this kind of thing. So thoughts are, it, let me back up one second. Um, <laughs> and I know I've covered this before, so I'm gonna cover it very quickly because we talked about this last time, but in case someone um, didn't hear that discussion or, or forgets, senses are these cells within our body, our eye, our skin, our nose, our, our mouth, it's our, that are taking physical entities in the universe, They're like wavelengths of light, physical touch, and translating that into nerve signals, into electrical signals in the body. That's how Sen- the nervous senses system. Senses meaning taste, yeah. feel, yep. sight, hearing, hearing yeah, the five exactly. senses. Gotcha. The five senses. And people always say, well, what about intuition? That's different. That's not a sense. That's a 
that's it, actually a sense of your internal world. It's called interoception as huh. opposed to exteroception, huh. sense of the outside world. So the five senses. And we are very, whether or not people like it or not, we are heavily constrained by those senses. For instance, a mantis shrimp, of all things, can see like 64 different shades of color that we can only see one shade of, for instance, because they have receptors that can pick out those things. Um, some animals can see ultraviolet emissions, others can see infrared, a pit mm. viper can see your heat emissions. It, you know, humans wow. sometimes think they can see heat emissions, but they can't see heat emissions unless they put infrared goggles on, then they can't. So the senses constrain our experience of the world. And I don't doubt that there are some people that have a little quarter of a percent more UV detection, or mm -hmm. there's even some evidence for weak magneto reception in humans from good labs. A little really? bit of, yeah, and turtles have very strong magneto reception. What does that mean, magneto reception? They can sense magnetic fields, so they sense them as, you know, like that's a magnetically. Humans have, there's some evidence written up in Science Magazine if people want to look, look it up, which is a quality journal for weak magnetic sensing in humans, some no, humans, not strong. but okay. it's not strong, okay? And it's not in most strong in most people by any stretch. Whereas turtles can navigate long distances based on magnetic fields in the, in That's the ocean. Cool. It's very cool. That's cool. It's very cool. Um, so our experience of the world, all humans experience of the world is kind of tunneled by these, what we can see and what we can't see. There's a lot happening that we can't see. It's just the reality. That's mm -hmm. why we, that's why people need night vision goggles and supposed to just looking at things in the night without <laughs> them. So that's key. So there's sensation and then there's perception, which is simply to say, which of those things are we paying attention to? So I can see that this water bottle is, you know, a mixture of blue and glass and, you know, cause I decided to look at it, but I was mm -hmm. sensing it out of the corner of my eye the whole time, but I was focused on right. something. I okay. can sense the right. air touching my skin right. cause I'm deciding to focus on that. That's feeling. right. Yeah. That's right. So that's perception. And you want to just make sure that we close the hatch on interoception, perception of what's going on. Like I don't think about my heart rate too much, but if I stop and think about it, I'm thinking about my heart rate and then I'm just sensing my heart rate. It's, but it's mm -hmm. still just pressure. It's, you know, it's a physical phenomenon. Okay, um, then there's thinking, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. Then there's emotions slash feelings. And those are complicated, but they are tractable as we say, we can, we can figure it out. And then there's behaviors, like you're writing right now. It's a measurable thing, it's a real thing. Okay, so what about thoughts? What in the world is thinking? Well, in many ways, thinking is a lot like perception. Perception, again, being which sensations I'm focusing on, except that thinking incorporates sensations from the past, sensations from the present, and can include sensations from the future that we haven't even had yet. Interesting. So this, I think, speaks to your question about law of attraction, which is you know, never really been formalized in, for the scientific community. So I'm trying to mm -hmm. take, take it and cram it through a neuroscience filter sure. here, see what comes out the other side. But the, the interesting thing about thinking is it's very hard to control our spontaneous thoughts. So for instance, I can't prevent myself from thinking something. However, I can deliberately introduce a thought. People forget this, that one of our enormous powers is, as human beings is, is another form of top-down control which is to say, I'm gonna write out my name, I am Andrew, or I can think, I am Andrew. Now it takes a little bit of work, you kind of notice to, to think something specific, like you would write it out in your head, just as you would write it out on paper. It feels like a little bit of work, because it is work. You're taking that spontaneous thought process and you're inserting a thought on top of it. And we know that you can't hold too many thoughts in mind at once. So the, what I will say is that it's hard to suppress thoughts but it's actually quite easy to introduce thoughts. And it sounds to me like this, this law is basically a process of introducing thoughts. And when you start introducing thoughts and you start thinking of thoughts as a form of perception. The they, way you view the world. They sh they're gonna shape the way you, they're gonna shape what you see. Wow. They're very gonna he heavily constrain what you see. Now this has a dark side and a light side. <laughs> and I, I you know, Tell me. the dark side is, is that beliefs are essentially thoughts that are rec recurring thoughts or things that are kind of like books on a shelf that you can reach to anytime. If I say, hey, what about that book out there, you know, um, 
Jay Shetty's book. You can go grab it because it's on the shelf right there. Mm-hmm. You can show it to me, right? It's there all the time. You know where it is, and it's very accessible. Whereas, if so you, beliefs are reoccurring thought, right? So you said, yeah. yeah. Whereas if you, where, whereas if you have um, have never thought about something in particular, like um, if I, you know, we start having a discussion about something that you're not very familiar with, or you tell me about something I'm not very familiar with then it's gonna take some work, it mm-hmm. feels like work. So To understand it, to right. perceive it, to experience it, right. to take it in, to, to question your previous beliefs about something, that's all right. that, right? And there's some interesting data that were published in the journal Neuron this last year, not from my group, that show that beliefs actually have their own rewarding quality. That there's actually dopamine release associated with beliefs. Having an, a belief. Yes. So when you believe something, you're, there are chemical reward systems in your mind that are associated with just repeating that belief. Now, again, this has a dark side and a light side. The dark side is it means that people can be very fixed in their beliefs and they're actually being chemically rewarded for having the same belief. The world is flat. I believe the world is flat and just saying it over and over right. again. Or in-group, out-group type thinking of any kind. Or what do you I mean be- in-group, out-group? Well, when people think, oh, I believe that that group of people over there is this way uh, and or good or bad, right? It's, there's a self-reward mechanism mm, that's getting engaged I am, there. I'm greater than this group. Could be greater than or less less than. So is you know, that beliefs are attached to a set of rewards. Interesting. So what... The, now, the dopamine system is exceedingly powerful because dopamine is, is a kind of a dumb molecule. It has no brain of its own. It's just a, it's just a molecule, right? It's just a yeah. chemical. But when dopamine is released in our brain, we, first of all, it tends to orient us towards goals in the outside environment. It's the, it's the molecule not just of reward, but of motivation. And when we release dopamine, we tend to see the world in terms of external goals. And so you can imagine now if there's a process built up inside us where our thoughts are causing dopamine release and dopamine is shaping what we see as rewards, what we perceive as rewards. Okay, so water, bright light, no caffeine until 90 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. What's next? Uh, Water with salt, okay. And then it's a question of whether or not I'm training that day or not. Uh, So I do believe getting exercise is important. I think the data, having reviewed the data and talked to uh, a number of experts on this, in particular, uh, there's a guy who's really terrific. um, You may know him, uh, Dr. Andy Galpin, who's down at Cal State Fullerton, uh, excellent exercise physiologist. But also if you look across the the mass of studies on exercise and heart health, there are a couple of things that become clear. One is that Everybody should be getting 120 to 150 and maybe even 150 to 180 minutes of so-called zone two cardio a week. This is the kind of cardiovascular exercise where you're doing work. You could have a conversation, but you're kind of at the threshold where it's not super easy to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. We're not talking sprints. There's just a myriad of effects on heart health, uh, you know, vascular health all over the body, gut microbiome, mus- musculoskeletal yeah. stability, mental health, all these kinds of things. So I have a routine where I either weight train for an hour in the morning or I do a portion of that weekly cardio. Mm-hmm. And I just alternate, weight train one day, cardio the next, weight train, and then one day a week I don't do anything. I don't do any exercise. Six days a week you exercise. Yeah, day, and I miss days. So, you know, mm-hmm. occasionally because of travel or other schedules or appointments, I might take two days off. Yes. I never go seven days. I always, I per- personally do well having a complete day off each mm-hmm. week. But the hour of exercise generally is, you know, five, ten minutes of warm up, and then, and it's hard work, yeah. you know, and I don't, this is a new thing that we can get into when I talk about dopamine, but I do not allow myself to check social media, text message, phone calls, and lately not even music when I train uh, for reasons that we can get into later. I'm really trying to get focused on what I'm doing and I'm trying to extract the greatest amount of joy from the process Mm -hmm. in its purest form. So so no phone, essentially. I try not to have the phone. Occasionally I'll use music or I'll listen to a podcast because it's such a great time to do that. So I don't want to say I never do, but most of the time I'm trying very hard to just do my exercise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it doesn't matter if you, you know, run, swim, bike, row, uh, you know, people these days can do calisthenics or weight training or something of that sort. The weight training thing is interesting because muscle building aside, it's very clear that five sets a week per muscle group is what's required to maintain muscle. Mm. 
and this is true for men, this is true for women. And obviously in young kids, you don't want them weight training with heavy loads because it can shut down their long bone growth. That's the myth or the what they say anyway, but I don't know, kids are developing anyway. Right. So I don't know, I'll leave that to the, to the coaches to decide that and the parents. But I think for people that are in their late teens, early 20s and onward, it's really important. If you look at longevity, a lot of the major injuries and early deaths and um, not just due to accident, but you know, chronic illness comes from people br- falling and breaking a hip, mm-hmm. and just not being strong. And so I think being strong, regardless of who you are, is important. And so that's five sets per week minimum per muscle group and probably more like 10. Uh, routines splay out differently. So I do my mm-hmm. thing, people have their thing. Um, so I, I try and exercise or I do a 90 minute work bout. And if I exercise, we could talk about that, then I would shower and do my 90 work, minute work bout, but sometimes I do the 90 minute work bout first. Mm-hmm. And that's generally what, when I'm starting to drink the caffeine. And the 90 minute work bout is a serious, non-negotiable time in which I don't allow myself to be on the internet, I'm not checking email, I'm not texting, my phone is off, 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 and not, you know, not on airplane mode. And, mm. and it's a process of learning to focus and learning to do what we call no-go functions in the brain. So we have an area of the brain called the basal ganglia that control go functions like reaching out for a pen and no-go, which is resisting the urge to do something. And these are circuits that are very mm. important for learning how to control attention and for controlling behavior. Young animals, puppies, humans, don't do no-go very well. Do you know the, the two marshmallow? T- yes. T- okay, the yes. two marshmallow, you offered kids a, t- uh, two, a marshmallow and you say, if you don't eat it, you'll get two marshmallows. In 10 minutes. Um, in 10 minutes, minutes, some yeah. kids can do it. That's pure, that's a no-go task. You're saying, how well can you resist the urge to just go and eat the marshmallow? And there are a number of things that mimic this. Another no-go type behavior would be meditation, for instance, where you sit down, it's kind of painful to sit cross-legged, your thoughts are drawing you off, you remember something you need to do, and you're resisting the temptation to get up and do something else. And so this 90-minute work bout is a kind of combined meditation, but also functional work for me. So for me, that could be writing, it could be planning a podcast, it could Mm. be um, reading. It's something that's kind of hard and the thing to understand about this 90 minute work bout is that you should expect some friction early on. It's not like you just flip a switch and you're in. That it takes some time to get into this focus mode and throughout that time, your brain will flicker in and out. And there's a tool that you can use to enhance your focus prior to this 90 minute work bout. And I actually do this, it sounds a little crazy, but it actually is grounded in really good neuroscience, which is that you place a cross hatch, or, you know, just a target at some distance on a piece of paper and you force yourself to stare at it and not blink for about 30 to 60 seconds. And what you're doing Mm -hmm. is you're ramping up the neural circuits in the brain that drive go, Mm -hmm. no-go, and harnessing your visual attention. Your focus. You're focusing. Visual focus drives cognitive focus. And for people that aren't sighted, auditory focus drives cognitive focus. So visual focused drives cognitive focus. Yes. These two little bits of that we call eyes are, as uh, people probably heard me say before, are two little bits of brain that are outside the cranial vault. Mm -hmm. They're the only way that your brain knows what to do in terms of whether or not it's day or night, who's out there, et cetera, but it's also a mechanism by which you draw your attentional systems into, from kind of everywhere, you know, imagine spotlights just kind of moving around, bringing those spotlights to a common location and then intensifying that spotlight. Mm. And since most work involves what we call exterocepting, looking outside ourself, this is very different than lie, you know, sitting in meditation where you're focusing internally. Because when you sit down to work, you kind of want to forget about your heartbeat and how your feet feel on the floor and that your back and you know mm-hmm. might be a little sore or something. You want to be in the work. And so I do I set a timer and I force 90 minutes of this and it and it's really tough, Lewis. Some days, <laughs> some days I it's anything to go get something out of the fridge. Any, any, get up and distract myself. And occasionally and, I fail. I will get up and go do something and or I'll look at my phone. I do falter sometimes. But if you can learn to do this 90 minute bout. And I bet consistently you can yeah. create some amazing work. You can do, you will do your best work. And what's really wonderful is it's not just about the work that you perform in that bout. What ends up happening is really special. This sort of combined meditation work bout, as I'm calling it, 
has this effect of you are actually tuning up and making your neural circuits for focus and attention better. So that after that, okay, you flip on the internet, you check your email, you're doing text messaging, you're probably hungry now. I'm hungry if I've, if I've exercised, I'll eat my meal, my, my lunch. Uh, I tend to fast till about lunch most days. But what happens then is after lunch or something, you decide, oh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna sit down and, and read something or I'm gonna do some more work but I've only got 20 minutes. You can drop in like a laser. It's re- wow. because the circuits have learned. You, you recognize that state. It's a, I guess the, the analogy would be you do your hardest workout in the morning mm-hmm. and you, you or maybe it's a skill learning period. I know because you used to play professional sports. Yeah, yeah. And then in the afternoon, it's gonna be hard to recreate that entire yes. 90 minute session. But you go back and you can drill it and you're right there because your nervous system recognizes you're right there. Mm-hmm. And you, and so that's a, a, a holy part of my morning, as wow. holy as the sunlight viewing. Wow. And it's something that's very hard to build in, but I actually schedule it just like I would a Zoom call. And and it's really, it's cool because when you, then for instance, if you have a social interaction where someone comes to you and they say, I've got something to do and you're sort of distracted or something I need to tell you, you'll notice that you can quickly intensify that at, uh, what we call attentional spotlight mm. in, in neuroscience. Wow. And so it's a skill. And I hear these days a lot about attention deficit and trouble focusing. And indeed, some people have clinically diagnosed attention deficit. And I want, you know, I, there are resources for them. I did a whole podcast on ADHD. But many people don't have attention deficit in the clinical sense. They created it because they've never actually taught their brain how to focus for very long. And the phone's sitting right here and there's distraction everywhere. And then, of course, it raises all these questions. Like people say, well, do you listen to music? Do you mm. listen to white noise? There are a lot of tools and tricks. Sometimes music helps. Sometimes music hinders. Sometimes being in a cafe can help. Sometimes pure silence helps. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really individual and it's really context dependent. So I don't sure. want to give sure. a, a, a prescriptive. But that 90-minute work bout, if I can do all those things and then get that 90-minute work bout and then eat my lunch, I feel like the, the system is set to make the rest of the day even better. Because we often hear about the perfect morning routine but we're not thinking about how that routine influences the rest of the mm-hmm. day's routine. Yes. Say I feel cold and yeah. ice, right? It's, right? I'm in ice, it's 30 degrees. Right. Can I control my mind to say, you know what, this is actually a hot tub and you feel warm and you're feeling hot right now? Or is it too much physiological ba- barriers to break through that? Uh, to some extent you can. So I think that, um, the question that you're asking is a very important one. It's actually the question, which is, to what extent does our subjective narrative, the our, story, we, the tell story we tell ourselves, actually mean something for the body? And to what extent do does the body actually mean something for the subjective narrative? So this gets into some areas of, of work that we're doing now, and so I do wanna highlight that it's ongoing work, but I think you know, the old narrative, meaning a few, 10 years ago, was that if you're feeling depressed, just smile. Well, if that worked, <laughs> right. we would have a lot less depression than we see out there. Right, right. Now that does not mean- well, Most people actually who are depressed just aren't smiling That's as right. well. Like when you change your physiology, doesn't it also start to change the way you think about yourself a the, little bit? The reason I call it a brain-body contract early on is that the brain and the body are constantly in dialogue. So, you know, the idea that when we're depressed, we tend to be in more defensive type postures. When we're feeling good, we tend to be in more like relaxed and extended postures, all true. But it does not mean that just by occupying the extended posture that I'm gonna completely shift the mind. Right. That's a first step. Think about like two interlocking gears. It's one gear that turns the other, but then they need to kind of dance together before you can get the whole system going. So and how so, do you get it to dance together? Exactly, so subjective, there is one way in which subjective thought and deliberate thought is very powerful over states of mind and body. To answer your question, can you think your way out of the ice bath being cold? So a couple things that are important. First of all, just to go a little deeper on what thoughts are. Thoughts happen spontaneously all the time. Mm -hmm. They're popping up like a poorly filtered internet connection. (laughs) But thoughts can also be deliberately introduced. For instance, right now, I can say, okay, have a thought that um, just decide to write your name and you're, you can do that. I'm gonna to decide to write yeah. my name and you can do it. So that's a deliberate thought, which says that you can introduce thoughts. So I think it's very hard to control negative thoughts directly by trying to suppress them. 
they tend, generally they tend to just want to continue to geyser up all the time. Uh-huh. But we can introduce a positive thought. Can you think of two thoughts at the same time? Probably not. So you can only have one thought at a time. Right, but they come very fast. But it comes and goes. Maybe, comes. Right. So, you have, be, so you have to constantly be right. intentional and deliberate about what you think. Right. Otherwise, and a spontaneous thought will pop back in. That's right. Based on your experience, based on sensory, based That's on right. how you're feeling or perceiving something, your environment, it's just going to keep popping in. Right. So how do we deliberately have a positive thought more often? Right. So I'm, I'm a big fan of wellness and, and I think it's a great community, but it tends to run in absolutes and there, and there aren't a lot of operational definitions as we say in science. And I, what I love about your question is you're asking for the, really getting to the meat of things, asking for the operational definitions. One of the most dangerous ideas in wellness and in popular psychology is that your body hears every thought you have. What a terrible thing to put wow. on people. You know, what, what, wow. a, what, a, what a challenging thing. I don't think people should try and suppress their negative thoughts. I think there is great value, however, to introducing positive thought schemes. Now, the reason is not because I think it's just because I think so, but because there's actually a neurochemical basis for controlling stress and actually making stress more tolerable and extending one's ability to be in bouts of effort. And that relates to the dopamine pathway. So the molecule dopamine is a reward. It's released in the brain when you win a game, you, you know, close a deal, you Someone meet likes the your love photo. of your life. Someone likes, Someone your, likes photo. your photo. <laughs> the great love of your life, you complete something. But most of our dopamine release is not from achieving goals. It's actually released when we are en route to our goals, where we're in pursuit of our goals, and we think we're on the right path. This is why a lot of people get depressed after they achieve a big goal, That's because right. they feel like, I'm supposed to feel something greater. I felt this thing for two minutes and now that's it? That's right. High achievers know to attach dopamine to the effort process. To the pursuit, the day-to-day tasks, the, the growth, the lessons, the losses, like everything, right? It, well, and it can be to some wins along the way, yeah. but growth mindset, which is the academic discovery and laboratory discovery of my colleague Carol Dweck at Stanford, is the hallmark of growth mindset is, to, is really two things. One is, I'm not where I want to be now, but I, but I will, I'm capable of getting there eventually. The other is to attach a sense of reward to the effort process itself. In fact- Don't in, reward the result, reward the effort. That's right. And if you look at true high performers, people that are consistently good at what they do, they don't peak and go through the postpartum depression and crash and come back and their life is a cycle of ups and downs, but really people who are on that upward trajectory <clears throat> consistently, those people attach dopamine to the effort process. And actually Carol's, one of her original studies on the discovery of growth mindset was these kids that loved doing math problems that they knew they couldn't get right. So it's like the people love puzzles, but in this case, they knew they couldn't get it right, but they loved doing it. And it, incidentally or not so incidentally, these kids are fantastic at math when there is a right answer because they <clears throat> they feel some sense of reward from the effort process. Yeah. Now the cool thing about dopamine is that it's very subjectively controlled. We can all learn to secrete dopamine in our brain in response to things that are in a purely subjective way. Our interpretation. And our interpretation, and but it has to be attached to reality. So, you know, one should never confuse- What is real? Right, so no, so <laughs> if, you're eff, if you're thinking about the effort you're expending, so let's say somebody right now is financially back on their heels mm-hmm. and they're setting up a new business, for instance, and it's hard. If they can take a few moments or, or minutes each day to reflect on the fact that the effort process is allowing them to climb out of their hole potentially, that it's giving them an opportunity, that it's somehow, po- they are on the right path, or, or if they're not in movement along that path, or at least oriented on the right path, they're not lying in bed all day. They're back taking on a their heels. step. They're forward. taking a step. If they can reward that process internally, two things happen. First of all, the brain circuits that are associated with building subjective rewards and dopamine get stronger, so you get better at that process. And second, and most importantly, dopamine has an amazing ability to buffer adrenaline and buffer epinephrine. And what I mean by that is, there was a study that was published in the journal Cell, excellent journal, Cell Press Journal, a couple years ago, showing that with repeated bouts of effort, we use and we release more and more epinephrine. It's kind of adrenaline, but in the brain. 
With more effort, we're every time, this. every time you put in effort. So every time you make let, for this, let's keep it. If I were to keep it in the business context, every time you make to write that email, every time you let's see, it's a, a person who's a craftsman or a craftswoman. Every time you're working in the in the shop and doing that, every bit of effort, you're taking a little bit of money out of this epinephrine account. You're spending epinephrine. Now, at some point, those levels of epinephrine get high enough that you you feel like quitting. It feels exhausting. <laughs> and this was done in a beautiful study actually where um, they control the visual environments and they have the subjects ex exert effort and they can control the visual environment. So sometimes the effort of, of taking steps and moving forward, this is actually kind of pushing forward and kind of swimming motion, um, would give them the sensation that they were actually making progress. And other times it was an exercise in futility where they would just keep the, the visual world stationary and they would expend effort and they didn't think they were going anywhere. Epinephrine's climbing, 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 and eventually they quit. Now dopamine is able to push back on that epinephrine and give you, anyone, the, the feeling that you could continue and maybe even the feeling that you want to continue. And you've seen this actually, like football is a good example. Two teams play, say the Super Bowl, both teams are max effort the entire time. Yeah. Max effort. The team that wins suddenly, in a moment, has the energy to jump all over the place, party for days. <laughs> they can talk, I mean, they, they, they have They're exhausted energy. right before That's right. then. Well, that wasn't glycogen or stored energy of any kind, except it was neural energy. And what happened was effort is this adrenaline, 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 adrenaline. Eventually people quit. They just quit. The dopamine is able to suppress that. And so then you're expending effort, but you're doing it from a place of feeling like you have energy for it. So we need dopamine to keep the effort going. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's right. Dopamine is not just about reward. It's one of the biggest misconceptions. Dopamine is about motivation mm. and drive. It's like a jet that propels you along a path. So how, any, how do we get more dopamine? You practice subjectively releasing dopamine in your mind. Like how? Okay, so th that's a great question. First of all, there are ways you can get more dopamine release through thoughts or through drugs or through supplements. I wanna be really clear, there is a drug, there are two drugs actually, that will cause massive release of dopamine. They're called cocaine and methamphetamine. <laughs> the problem is- That's what is, gets us addicted because it feels so good. The problem is, exactly, the problem is <laughs> do, cocaine and methamphetamine stimulate so much dopamine release that the drug becomes the only source. It becomes the goal of and joy. the path. It becomes the path and the destination. And you look at people's lives when they do a lot of cocaine and methamphetamine and that baseline on their life goes down very, Because there's very no fast. reason to work hard at anything else because you feel good. That's right. And that's the greatest feeling you'll have, so why do anything else when you can have that feeling? That's right. And if you think about, do remember these neurochemical systems, adrenaline, cortisol, dopamine, epinephrine, they weren't designed to keep us safe from tigers and to hunt and gather or to build Fortune 500 companies. They were designed to do anything they were designed mm -hmm. to be generic so that depending wow. on our circumstances, we could adapt. So wow. in an animal context, an animal that um, let's say is hunting or it needs food for its young, it's gonna feel agitation, that's stress, that's cortisol, it's like hunger, my babies might not eat, I might not eat, maybe it's looking for a mate, it's gonna feel agitation and start looking and roaming and searching, mm. foraging, as it's called in the animal behavior world, it's foraging. At some point, it might catch a smell of something, uh, a potential mate or berries or a stream if it's thirsty. At that moment, dopamine is released and now it has energy to continue along that path. Mm. Whereas there's a specific pathway in the brain in, that's involved huh. in depression and disappointment that if it goes to that place and it turns out it was the wrong path, there's a signal that actually suppresses dopamine so that you don't repeat that mistake again. So you don't give up. That's right. You just don't repeat it again. That's right. And those events that- So it reminds you like that's not the path to go down. That's right. Interesting. And, and we're sort of veering towards neural plasticity here, which is the brain's ability to change itself in response to experience. Dopamine is one of the strongest triggers of neuroplasticity because it says those actions led to success previously you're gonna repeat those. Do those. Those actions led to failure previously, and don't repeat those. So, so dopamine triggers us to stay on the right path. Th that's right, so you asked how do you do this? So to really yes. make it concrete. And is there too much, is there too much thing, is there such thing as too much dopamine? Well. If you're not on drugs? It, so 
Cocaine and amphetamine are bad because they yes. lower the baseline on life. They make people very focused on things outside of themselves. That's the other thing that dopamine does. It can be positive or negative. But when we have dopamine in our system, we tend to be outward facing and in pursuit of things in our environment. You can look at somebody on cocaine and realize that that's the extreme version of that. But, but the, you know, I love social media for the reason that you see the mo molecules in the memes. So it's like, get after it. You know, what do sharks do on Monday? Or I can't remember the specific yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. Or then they're the, like, sometimes it's just time to chill. Well, that's a different molecule. That's serotonin, right? And then dopamine is the get after it molecule. And epinephrine is effort. So if we were gonna break this down really concrete, yes. we'd say adrenaline and epinephrine are about effort, just effort with no subjective label on them, good or bad, effort. Whether or not stress or you're pursuing something you wanna do, it's just, it's in exerting effort. Dopamine is about reward, but more so about motivation and pursuit of rewards. And then we'll get to it in a little bit, but serotonin is a different source of reward, but it comes from more relaxed states and it resets the whole system. And it's associated with things like sleep and gratitude and meditation and especially gratitude. And then just, I guess, to round this out, the cortisol system is more of a, like a longer term stress. Yeah. Okay, so we've all heard the sayings, you know, how do you, you know, journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, or how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, all, there are all these sayings, and, and it you know, goes back to the Bible and earlier, yeah. right? I mean, this is not new, these are not new sayings, but they're showing up in different forms. What's lost in those short descriptions, however, is that every step is not equivalent. If it were just that a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, everyone would pursue their goals. Everyone would push back against adversity. Everyone, I mean, you can read the inspirational stories as many times as one needs. And I do think inspirational stories are of very high value. In fact, I think they're vicarious dopamine. I think they give us the sense that we could, which then hope. orients hope, which then orients us to the world to again. To start, yeah, yeah. So right. it's, maybe it's possible for me. That's right. So let's say, um, let's take the example of somebody who's... Um, but with this finish, that's that story of, it's not about just taking a single step and one step at a time. Is it because there's adversities every 10 steps you go and so it's harder and harder? So it's it, not just well, it's just very non-linear. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's some days go, you know, I know this from my scientific career. It's, you know, some days it's easy, some days it's hard. It's all over the place, mm -hmm. right? So I think... The thing to remember is that dopamine is this incredibly powerful molecule that allows us to buffer the effort process. It allows us to be in effort longer and it allows us to actually eventually enjoy the process of effort. And not think about the reward, but just say, oh, I'm enjoying the process. Right. Well, you just described the first step. The first step in learning to attach dopamine to the effort process, which is the key operation in order to succeed, is to be very careful about how much you focus on the end goal. Keeping the goal in mind is important for like a proper orientation. You have to know the ultimate destination. But if at any point we were to evaluate our progress relative to that end goal, or if we don't know what the end goal is, there's a huge gap there right. and it can feel overwhelming. And depressing and I'm not good enough. That's right. I should just give up. What am I doing this for? That's right. And it's those a, thoughts will affect us. And they're very realistic. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, as Carol will say, and other people have said in the psychology field, you know, positive self-talk, oftentimes, unless you do it correctly, you're badly wrong. Mm. It, you know, lying to yourself won't work. Saying, right. saying, I'm, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, when, when you, you haven't lost won, or you haven't won yet <laughs> yeah. is, is great, but that's not the most effective use of these systems. Well, you're also being out of integrity with yourself. You're, you're telling yourself a lie. Right. You're like, and then you're losing your ability to have confidence because you're just lying to yourself. Right. And if it's really extreme, there's a name for it. It's called delusional, right? <laughs> right? Right. And people will start to point that out and then it becomes harder to recruit people into your, your goals. So I think the key thing is to attach that sense of reward to the effort process. It's saying, look, I am oriented in the right direction and rewarding the things you're not doing. I'm not back on my heels. I'm not just staying you know, in bed in the morning. I'm not, yeah. A good example of this came to me recently. I have a good friend, he did nine years in the SEAL teams. His name is Pat Dossett. And, and we were talking about, you know, the Admiral McRaven thing, you know, get up and make your bed. And, you know, and they, they really do that. And, and I think the way it was described was 
Um, you know, so at the end of the day, even if everything doesn't go well, your bed is still made. Mm -hmm. For me, that's not that big of a reward, frankly. Right. I, but I, and so I said that, and I- I well, love it though, I make my bed, I mean. Oh, I definitely make my bed in the morning, but I mean, it, going back and seeing that at the end of a hard day, mm -hmm. it, it's not enough, it, I felt like there was something else there. So mm -hmm. I asked him, he said, well, it's very interesting because part of it is about not just making your bed, but it's the things you're not doing by making your bed. You're not lying in bed and ruminating. Mm. You're not back on your heels. You're not and on your phone. That's right. Yeah. When, so when you look at, and you have spent a lot of time with people in mm. high performing communities, mainly through some consulting work, but what you find is that, you know, we can all be either be back on our heels, flat footed or forward center of mass. Forward, yeah. And when you look at people who are in these high performance communities, they try and keep their center of mass forward. Almost through what seem like trivial things, like making your bed or making the cup of coffee, but it's not just Washing about what teeth, you're doing, like, yeah. it's all the things you're not doing that can put you down the path of ruminating or put you down the path of um, unhealthy behavior. So the key to this is, if we wanna be very concrete, we should probably focus on actions, and I'll mm -hmm. use fitness as an example because it translates to everybody, whereas you know, people's circumstances sure. differ. Let's say somebody really wants to take on a fitness routine they hate running or they want to lose weight in a, in a healthy way, this kind of thing. So we've all heard the example, well, you put your shoes by the door on day one, day two, you put them on, day three, you go out the door, day four, you walk around the block and then, you know, and then eventually like they're running marathons. Okay, <laughs> great, but to sustain that behavior or even to make the, the behavior pleasurable and to give you energy, the key is to subjectively reward those steps. So it's not gonna be, mm. let's say I go out and I run a mile and my goal is to run 10 miles in a few weeks. The key is, as you're in the strain of that mile, the hard part, you wanna tell yourself, this is the good part. This is the part that gives me energy. And I'll be very surprised if people don't actually feel like they could continue further. So it's a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single, is made up of you know, single steps, but the key is to reward the harder steps, not the easier ones and not the ones where you get the thing that you want. Don't reward yourself for putting your shoes on and taking a step outside. You could if that was a huge barrier for you. If it was very hard. If it was very hard for you. But but running the 10 miles that's is hard. Right. Find the wall and push a little bit further through that wall and reward that process. When we have dopamine uh, triggered in our body, it's attached to, because it's attached to some type of belief, we're gonna to continue to say, this feels good. That's right. So let me keep thinking this way. And viewing the world this in way. In this way, because it's right. gonna keep making me feel good. That's right. Physically. That's right. Wow. Even right. if it's fact or not fact, right. scientifically true or, or not true. Or harmful to other people or harmful Ooh. to yourself. If it makes you feel good, you might stick to that belief. That's right. So a good example with dopamine is, it, with anytime thinking about science and neuroscience in particular, thinking at the extremes can be kind of useful. Mm -hmm. So people who are very depressed, who see no possibility in the world, mm -hmm. who, if you talk to a depressed person, every response they give is going to be, but it's not gonna work out. It doesn't they work for me. They are absolutely yeah. certain that things are gonna turn out bad. And there's a benefit for having that belief, and right? And they're, they're entrenched in it. They may actually be rewarding that somewhat, although typically depressed states have very low dopamine. Oh. At the opposite extreme is mania. When people are in a manic phase, <laughs> dopamine is very high, we know this, and they see possibility everywhere, and there's certain things are gonna work out. They, they will spend money they don't have, they'll create relationships they don't have time and energy for, they will overdo everything. And so somewhere in the middle is this healthy range where mm. We're con where we realize that how we view the world is shaping the release of these chemicals. And I do believe this happens when we have positive thoughts, we, we get a lift. If we, if we can get a lift from our positive thoughts and then dopamine itself puts us in relationship with the outside world such that we view the outside world as having more possibility, that is going to put us into forward momentum. Mm. There's, they're good, there are a lot of studies to support that. When dopamine is low, we tend to see very little possibility in the world. And so and, a positive thought triggers forward movement potentially. Yes. Yeah. So positive thinking, which a lot of people will say, well, that's just positive thinking, it doesn't work. Some people say, well, be positive, think positive, others say, well, it doesn't work. But with science, I'm hearing you say it gives you a little bit of a lift. Absolutely. The, the key with positive thinking it, is that it has to be honest. 
it it can't be I've already won, you know, I don't have an Olympic gold medal. <laughs> if I could tell myself I'm going to get one tomorrow, but I just don't have the skills. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to release dopamine in my system. How do you know it's honest if you're in a depressed state and you don't believe the, that you are actually better off than where you're at? The key is to attach the... So one thing to understand is that dopamine release in the brain is always subjective. There's no experience that that says uh, that has unique domain over dopamine release that will only allow dopamine release. So if it's very subjective, so if I say to myself, I'm going to um, get into the process of doing something. We have a new mm -hmm. year coming up, so mm -hmm. there's gonna be a lot of resolutions soon. The it's not, a, if you attach the dopamine release to the process of effort or goal setting itself, you'll have more energy to be in effort. And then if you can attach dopamine release to the belief that you're at least heading in the right direction, you'll have more energy to keep going in the right direction. People make the mistake of thinking that the, the th positive thought process should be attached to the finish line. It's not about thinking you've already mm -hmm. won. It's not about being delusional. It's about thinking that your training is gonna take you to the finish line. And so it's about moving that <clears throat> mental horizon in more close, more closely, and then triggering some sort of positive internal representation of what you're doing, meaning thinking positive. And people, this is usually where I get stopped and people say, wait, but it sounds so subjective. Tell me exactly how to do it. But here's <laughs> the key point, it's, su it's supposed to be subjective. This is this for you, right? For, yeah. for everyone needs to figure out what allows them to continue to be in forward momentum, mm. what allows them to, to constrain the world of possibilities and to go after goals and how often to self reward. Because, the, but the key is the self word. Because if you start only pursuing external rewards, that's when you are no longer in control of your dopamine system. Because you're reliant on actually something physically happening in the physical world, not internal. That's Ooh. right. And let's be really, really honest and burst the, the bubble that I feel like should have been burst a long time ago, which is, yes, everybody, including me, it is possible that you can do everything and still fail. No one wants to say that. But the way that you ensure against that is to attach reward to the effort process. Because the dopamine molecule creates a sense of certainty and you're not trying to create certainty about the final outcome. Mm. You're trying to create certainty only about the next outcome that's en route to the final outcome. Mm. The next action the next, outcome. So yeah. you want to think about milestones. Yes. And so people set out with, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna write the great American novel, or I'm going to um, you know get the IPO. And of course, that's an important. You need to have a sense of what the finish line would actually look like. But the more that one can attach this subjective release of dopamine process to the intermediate steps through positive thinking and action, positive thinking and action, the, the higher that probability goes toward, in science we say there's a probability of zero to one, the higher that probability goes to one, which is certainty. Now, everyone knows in the back of their mind that there is no absolute certainty. When I hear about you know athletes or fighters, I was certain I was gonna win, we all know that there's a 0. .00000 doubt in everybody. Right. 0. .00 whatever that is. Now, for some people, they might be able to push that number way, way out. But certainty about outcome is actually a form of delusion. <laughs> certainty it's about- like a mania, yeah. That's right, like, cer that's right. You see this in mania. Mm -hmm. And that's why people start engaging they're, they're in behaviors that aren't fixated on like, right. this is going to happen. That's right. The silver lining in this is that when you create certainty about outcomes you know you can control, you take over this neurobiological system and you create almost certainty that you will complete the process to the end goal perfectly. Right. And by perfectly, I don't mean that you won't have to re-steer or orient differently along the way. What I mean is that you're, you're learning to engage a process. And so to make this concrete, because we, you threw a, a somewhat a theoretical question at me, yes. so yeah, like weave through that, <laughs> is that positive thinking is not about being delusional. Positive thinking is about learning how to take control of internal processes and understanding that that will shape your external environment. But it's about remaining in control of the internal landscape. Mm. It's about knowing that despite shifts in the external landscape, you're gonna be okay. Mm. Now there is a, a, there is a little twist, there's a little cul-de-sac that, do <laughs> that dopamine can take you into. I have a friend, he's a cardiologist up north, and he, um, and he has this, uh, this anecdote he likes to tell, which is he said, you know, some people 
get so much dopamine release from these intermediate goals that they never make it to the end goal. And here's how this sometimes happens. I worry this might have happened to me several times in my lifetime, but. Like, give me an example. An example would be, I tell you, Lewis, I'm writing a book. And you say, oh, that's awesome. That's gonna be so fantastic. I'm sure people are gonna be really excited. And I get so much dopamine that I stop continuing in the process. Just from the action of because talking about it. And it becomes its own finish line. Mm. And we know people like this, some of us can recognize behaviors like this in ourselves. People reflect back such confidence in our ability to do things that we never actually do. <laughs> I know I could do right. it. This I've is got the, the skills. This yeah. is the beauty of the underdog. Oh. An underdog mentality is I'm never gonna allow myself to think I'm gonna win so that I can keep winning. But that's a high friction way to go through life. So the way that it was taught to me best, I think was my graduate advisor. She said, uh, we published our first paper, it turned out great, it was in a great journal. And she said, this is wonderful, I'd worked very hard on it, frankly. And she said, look, just remember, you're never as good as you think you are, you're never as bad as you think you are. Right. You're somewhere in the middle, but you can get really good at the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, there's a lot of kind of you know treacherous thinking around goal setting and dopamine and things. There's this idea that if we're really amped up, that we're just going to have jet thrusters that are going to take us to the end. But the key is to move that horizon in closer and closer. And, what, and a way that one could do this, for instance, would be you get up in the morning, or let's say you're you're kind of low energy in the afternoon. That you do your breathing to get more alert, but you've got this voice of doubt. There's like a voice of doubt. Is this working? I don't know, I don't know. Remember, you can introduce thoughts on top of that. You're not gonna get very far trying to suppress the, these thoughts. The better thing to do is just, you know, kind of swamp them with, with positive thought. Then if you can- So don't not think about the negative thought, add positive yeah. thinking and possibilities right. and opportunities into your, your thinking. That's right. But trying to suppress the negative thoughts is like whack-a-mole. They just keep popping up all <laughs> over the place. And, you know, it's, and it's a lot of work. Yeah. But there is a way to play a slightly different game, right? And I think that the, in learning how to think positively and register the positive feelings that come from that, and then you use that as a way to propel to the next the next goal. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about this in kind of um, kind of self-help wellness space and tacking some neuroscience to it, some you know speculative neuroscience explanations. However, we have to remember that this mechanism of dopamine and pathfinding to goals is in every animal, humans, dogs, sheep, any animal that needs to forage for things, to for find food, food or water, yeah. they don't just <clears throat> get that dopamine release at the end. They get it when they realize they're on the right track. So a grazing animal might be on a really barren landscape and then smell something off of the <gasps> environment. Now that was an external pull or think, you know what? I'm gonna go that way because I don't know, I need to go some way. They go some direction and they don't smell water, which animals can do. And so they veer off course and then all of a sudden they get a little bit of scent of water. At that point, that's when the dopamine is released, not when they get the water and drink from it. So that puts them in energy to get there. You know, you think about walking in the desert and you're just dying of thirst and all of a sudden you spot a big lake. All of a sudden you will have the energy to run the remaining mile. <laughs> Whereas before you thought you were gonna die. Yeah. How is that? How is that? It's not like more gl glycogen is suddenly available. It's not like ketones did it for you. So what did it? That's dopamine. That's mm. dopamine release that says there's a reward waiting for me. And that's from the, the brain. It's from the brain it's from is the, releasing dopamine right. or is it a, a, a nerve connected to the gut that goes back to the brain? What is the process? Great question. So there's an area of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, substantia nigra, all these areas um, have different names, but that release dopamine into the brain and they give the immediate sense of possibility and they promote energy. Wow. And epinephrine or adrenaline is a molecule that we're all associated with. It's what gives us energy. It's actually the, when it goes really high, it's the basis of the stress response, which is a lot of energy. But epinephrine is manufactured, it's made from the molecule dopamine. It's wow. a couple biochemical steps, but it's actually made from dopamine. Epinephrine gives you energy? Epinephrine is essentially the basis of neural energy. It's the, the way Brain that Brain energy. Feel. Yeah, the, the ability to focus, the ability to be alert, the ability to continue working. So dopamine is, is kind of the building block of So we need dopamine energy. to have That's focus, right. to work towards a goal, That's to right. accomplish things. That's right. So if we think negative thoughts consistently, does negative thoughts generate dopamine? Okay, so there are a couple things that can suppress dopamine. One of them, which I'll just put out there because I think a lot of people will um, 
They will either like this or not like this. A lack of sleep um, or what? Turns out that, and this was published in the journal Cell by uh, two groups working together. Samar Hattar is a good friend of mine, but he's head of the Chronobiology Unit, the National Institutes of Mental Health, and David Burson's lab at Brown University. Published a paper showing that exposure to screen type light between the hours of 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. activates a specific circuit in a brain area called the habenula, it's a weird name, that lowers dopamine and creates a sense of disappointment. <laughs> so it's pro-depressive. So every teenager in the world is depressing themselves. That's right. Or any adult. Yeah, we all do it. Who's on their phone after 11, after midnight, one, two, whether it be watching a movie, whether it be on an iPad, does it matter how close to a screen you are so on your if, phone? If you dim it way, way down, you don't get this dopamine. Or you wear the glasses or the biohacking effect. stuff. Or, you could do that as well. But Although it's, still, it's really the brightness of light, not the, the color of the light. So the studies by multiple groups are showing that from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m., if you're on your phone, if you're looking at a TV or, a, or a iPad or screen consistently, it's going to make you more depressed. In theory, yes. Um, in practice, you would have to do that pretty consistently. So there's not like one exposure. It's gonna, expo it's gonna or, dim dopamine. That's right, it's gonna blunt dopamine. And, and so our, our levels of things like dopamine and epinephrine, and serotonin, and these other so-called neuromodulators reflects the, our average behaviors, our average thinking. It's not like one thought's gonna crush your yeah. dopamine. However, if you've ever been working very, very hard or things are really bad and someone cracks a joke and it's actually funny to you, you feel an immediate lift. Yes. That's dopamine. Interesting. But here's the interesting thing. It has to be funny. If I don't think the joke is funny, let's say we're working very hard. Let's turn this around. Let's say we're working very hard and things are really terrible, like something really bad is happening and I make a joke and it's a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make it worse. But what's a good or bad joke? It's totally subjective. subjective. It's totally subjective. Is doing the things you know you should... Discipline is doing the things you know you should be doing, even when you don't feel like doing them. If you can develop the ability to do that, then you literally have unlocked the mm. ability to do anything in life, which unlocks the ability to achieve virtually anything.